Senate file number 1955 is herewith returned to the Senate. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, no action is required on that motion. The Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House refuses to concur in the Senate amendments to House File Number 1937. House File Number 1937, a bill for an act relating to state government, establishing a budget for the Department of Military Affairs and the Department of Veterans Affairs. The House respectfully requests that a conference committee of three members be appointed thereon. Newton, Elkins, and Bliss have been appointed as such committee on the part of the House. House File Number 1937 is herewith transmitted to the Senate with a request that the Senate appoint a like committee. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Mitchell for a motion. Yes, Mr. President, I move that the Senate accede to the request of the House for a conference committee on House File Number 1937 and that the conference committee of three members be appointed to the subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Mem members, just so that we're clear, Senator Mitchell moved that the Senate accede uh, to the request for the House for a conference committee on House File Number 1937 and that a conference committee of three members be appointed by the subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. On that motion, any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> members, uh, I am now going to ask the secretary to read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House refuses to concur in the Senate amendments to House File Number 1830. House File Number 1830, a bill for an act relating to state government, appropriating money for the legislature, certain constitutional officers, and certain boards, offices, agencies, etc. The House respectfully requests that a conference committee of five members be appointed thereon. Claiborne, Freiburg, Greenman, Hewitt, and Nash have been appointed as such committee on the part of the House. House File Number 1830 is herewith transmitted to the Senate with a request that the Senate appoint a like committee. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Murphy for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate accede to the request of the House for a conference committee on House File 1830 and that a conference committee of five members be appointed by the subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with the like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. For clarity, members, Senator Murphy moved that the Senate ascend to the request of the House for a conference committee on House File Number 1830, and that a conference committee of five members be appointed by the subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none on that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, the Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House refuses to concur in the Senate amendments to House File Number 2310. House File Number 2310, a bill for an act relating to state government, appropriating money for environment, natural resources, climate, and energy. The House respectfully requests that a conference committee of five members be appointed thereon. Hansen R., Acom, Hollins, Jordan, and Kraft have been appointed as such committee on the part of the House. House file number 2310 is herewith transmitted to the Senate with a request that the Senate appoint a like committee. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Herr for a motion. Mr. President, I move that the Senate accede to the request of the House for a conference committee on House file 2310 and that a, a com conference committee of five members be appointed by the subcommittees on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Mr. Members, Pre just to make sure that we're clear on the motion, Senator Herr moved that the Senate ascend to the request of the House for a conference committee on House File Number 2310, and that a conference committee of five members be appointed by this subcommittee on conference committees on the part of the Senate to act with a like conference committee appointed on the part of the House. Any discussion on that motion? All in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Members, now we will proceed to the ninth order of business, motion and resolutions. The next bill up on Senate, uh, excuse me, on special orders is House File 
92. Now 109 uh, on general orders. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'm sorry, would you please repeat what you just said? <laughs> Senator Kunis, uh, we are asking that the next bill that the, that the body um, uh, discuss is on, Senate, uh, is, is on special orders and is House File 2292. Okay. That's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, 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 um, that's number 109 on general orders. Uh, and we're calling on you now to tell us about a House File 2292, which is your pre-kindergarten statutes um, obsolete language removal bill. Yes, this is um, simply, uh, basically it's a vehicle bill that we will be using to um, attach early childhood items from the bill that we're going to be hearing here in a minute. And so uh, we will be pulling out the early ed, uh, early education parts of it and of the, the, the omnibus bill and putting it into this bill and we'll use that as a separate uh, conference committee uh, in the next couple of weeks. All right, any discussions on House File number 2292? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those. Oh. Sorry about that, members. We would, uh, um, the secretary will give House, Mr. House Mr. File President? 292. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Before we go to a roll call, I was wondering if Senator Kunish would yield for a question. So let me do one thing. Let me give it a third reading, and then you can certainly do that. Is that, is that okay, Senator Pratt? The Secretary will give House File 2292 his third reading. House File number 2292, a bill for an act relating to early childhood, removing obsolete language from voluntary pre-kindergarten statutes. Third reading. Now, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Kunish yield for a question? Senator Kunish, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kunish, I'm going to try to paraphrase what I thought I just heard, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. You're asking the body to pass a bill with language in it that will eventually be stripped out and replaced with other language that's coming from the bill we're going to be hearing next. And so you're asking us to pass a bill with language that won't survive after tonight. Senator Kunis, to the question. Uh, Mr. President, well, this bill, um, we passed this bill as a vehicle bill in the education policy, and it's intended to be amended with the Senate's proposal to allocate $300 million to early education education finance as a sub-target that's found within the E-12 finance joint budget uh, target. And this will allow the House Chair Pinto to convene a separate conference committee for the Senate. So we'll talk about early education uh, here in a little bit, and then we will amend it into this bill. Senator Pratt, any further, uh, any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Kunis yield for another question? Senator uh, Kunis, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Senator Kunis, why don't we just have an amendment for this bill then that would put the language in that you want? It seems like this is, you're asking the body to pass a bill with language that isn't going to be the, the bill in conference committee. And it just feels like it's a very non-transparent way for us to be doing business. Senator, uh, uh, I, 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 are you asking her to yield? President. Uh, will you yield? She will yield. To the question, Senator Kunish. Uh, Mr. President, well, I understand that this is how this has happened in the past. So this is uh, past practices. Um, we can discuss all the things in early education in the next bill, and then we'll just move them over to this. Any further discussion? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I am, I guess this is more of a point of parliamentary inquiry. Uh, and the, the question, or I could ask the, the chief of the deal, I'm just not clear in exactly what's happening here. So my question, I could ask it as a point of inquiry, or I could ask the, the uh, author of the motion or the bill. 
so we have a bill that's been brought before us of which you just gave a third reading. So the third reading, if, I under, if I'm following correctly, you just gave third reading on a bill and then we're talking about amending. So I'm not quite sure how are we going to, are we seeking to amend the bill you just gave a third reading on? Or are, and where, what are we amending into it? So my understanding is we're pulling, the majority wants to pull language out of the soon to come education finance omnibus bill that would go into this bill. Again, I'm, and then what exactly is the motion before us now? So with that, all that, Mr. President, I guess the question is, uh, would the chief author yield for, for that question? She will yield for questions. Uh, uh, Senator Kunis, did you hear the question? I did, Mr. Okay. President, and Senator thank you. Kunis. So um, I beg your pardon for my confusion or my uncertainty on this process. This is the first time I've had to do this. We actually are not putting language onto this bill. We are merely sending it over to the House. That way they will not concur and we will be able to create this uh, a conference committee to discuss these issues. So I'm sorry if I was confusing. I'm just sort of sorting it out in my head myself. There you go. <laughs> That's it now. All right. Um, seeing no further discussion. Mr. President. Because, oh, hold it. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, members, I don't know if anybody's as confused as I am, but I don't ever recall voting for language on a bill just to create a conference committee for language that's not in the bill. If we're going to pass a bill, we should have a Senate position on it. And I just don't understand why we're passing vehicle language when the House has already passed what they want. And my fear is that we are going to get a bill that is all of what the House wants and no one here in the Senate will have had the ability to debate what goes in that, to debate what gets passed, like we have with every other bill. I am concerned about the transparency of doing our business this way and uh, Mr. President, and I just want to make sure that that, uh, that concern is out there. Because I have never, in my 11 sessions, recalled passing a bill that we never intended to be the Senate position. Thank you. All right. We are certainly being active on this. Senator McQuay, before we get to Senator Kunish. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, members, um, in the other body, there is a separate early childhood education committee. In this body, we just have it in E12. So, when we pass this bill, this House file, we send it back to the House. They will not concur. A conference committee will be created where we can put in the early childhood education funding that is in the E12 bill that's contained within the Education Committee Finance Omnibus. So we will have a Senate position. It will go into that bill, but we don't have a separate committee through which we would create that omnibus bill to create a conference committee without doing it this way. So that's why we were doing it this way, Mr. President. It is just how we have it. Thank you. Senator Pappas. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And just for my colleagues, Senator Pratt and others here, this is not an unusual movement. It's really the result of the other body having a different structure than we do, and then trying to match up different provisions in different conference committees. So, Senator Pratt, I don't know, I've been here longer than you, so I guess I have seen this happen in the past. Senator Kunis. Paul Green. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Would Senator Mayquade yield for a question? Uh, who did you ask for? Mayquade. Uh, Senator Mayquade, she will yield for a question. Uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and thank you, Senator Mayquade. As you were describing this process, you had just referenced that this body would pass this bill before us. It would be sent over to the other body of which they would refuse to concur. How do you know that? Uh, Senator Mayquay, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the answer to that question is the chief author of this bill just shared that, or the, the chair of the committee just shared that before I spoke. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Would Senator Kunesh, which I presume is whose Senator Mayquay is referring to, would, she, would Senator Kunesh yield for a question? Senator Kunesh, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Kunesh. So 
if I understand correctly, we're being told that the other body will or will not do something with a bill once it passes this body. So we have a bill before us, and I presume you're going to walk in detail the bill before us and what it does, spending uh, and policy, before this body uh, passes or doesn't pass it, because members in this body are unfamiliar with it, we're not aware it was going to come and, and need an explanation. But if the, that bill passes this body and it's sent over, is it true that you are making the statement or that the statement is being made that they are going to refuse to concur? And if that is the case, how do we know that? Because it's my understanding that this body can't determine or tell the future of what another body may or may not do once it reaches that body. Senator Kunish. The, well, the situation is this. Um, in the House, Sen uh, uh, Representative Pinto has an early childhood omnibus bill. And part of his, um, part of his uh, omnibus bill are these early childhood jurisdictions that I have, that we have here in the omnibus bill. So what he has asked, and we've discussed it, is that, um, that we would send this vehicle bill over, so uh, they will refuse to concur, and that will create the, uh, the conference committee for this early childhood uh, section, and then they, uh, Senator, uh, Representative Pinto will have his conference in the House, and then we will have these items to conference in the Senate. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Kunish, for that explanation. All of it is true except for one aspect, and that is Representative Pinto or any other member of that body can not speak for the body and cannot speak for the future of what that body may or may not do. So, Mr. President and members, as we are considering the action in this body, it cannot be done under the auspices that the other body is simply going to refuse to concur because that cannot be known. We do not know. So, Mr. President, if this bill were to pass in order to be sent over there, it could pass, and under our Constitution, it would be sent to the governor for signature or veto. So I, I really take umbrage, and I don't understand how any member of this body, based on the word of one member of the other body, can say what the future action of 134 members of that body will be. That is an absolutely astounding statement that's being made here. And further astonishing that the majority would potentially act on that manner. So members, we need to act on this in a thorough manner. Again, I don't have the bill before us. I don't know what's in it. I haven't seen it yet. I'm presuming this hard copy is coming. We need to have a thorough debate and discussion based on the policy and finance that may or may not be in it because once it passes off this body, it may not be coming back. We don't know what's going to happen to it with the other body. So we need to make decisions as if it is the Senate position of whatever the language is and not presume that the other body will simply refuse to concur because one member of that body said so. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, any other discussion? Seeing none, the secretary take the roll on House File 2292. Members, please vote. Senator Boding, are you ready for those voting under Rule 40.7?
Mr. President, I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Rust votes aye. Senator Rust votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Are you ready, Senator Jasinski? Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Western votes no. Senator Western votes no. Okay. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 43 ayes and 24 noes. The bill is passed and its title agreed to. Members, we are now going to General Orders Number 163. It is House File Number 2497. It is the Senator Kunis Bill. For, it's the Omnibus Education Appropriations. Senator Kunis, are you ready to proceed? Senator Kunis. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, before we begin with that, uh, I do have an amendment. Is this the appropriate time? Uh, usually, uh, I mean, you could do it now, but it, it, it's up to you. Let me just put it that way. Okay. I have, um, I'll start with my bill and then we can go back to that. Okay. So Senator member, Cornish. Thank you. So members, um, this is the education finance bill for uh, the Senate. We've done a lot of work this past session uh, and it's been my pleasure to uh, have the support of my staff, Sammy Rajab and Dana Elling, Ryan Majers, our, C our Senate DFL uh, research. Our nonpartisan staff have put in so much time and energy and expertise. So thank you, um, Betsy um, Joseph, I hope you feel better, uh, Jenna Hofer and Anne Marie Lewis. The members of this committee uh, are composed of Senator Swadzinski, and, who is, uh, of course, the, the chair of education policy, and I want to thank his assistant, Regan uh, Green, and then, of course, Ed Cook for the work that he's done on our committee as well. We had some incredible pages, Claire De, uh, DeMay, Natalie Haberman, Marcus Paul, and our page supervisor extraordinaire is Margot Meyer. I want to thank you all for the good work that you've done, keeping us organized and uh, supplied with all the things that we need. Our committee member was made up of um, a number of folks that actually have experience in education. So the vice chair of this committee, Senator Gustafson, is a seasoned uh, educator, as well as uh, Senator Farnsworth. Appreciate the, the expertise in um, special ed that he brings to our committee. Uh, Senator um, Rarick also was a va valuable member of this committee. There is Senator Farnsworth, Senator Cruen, Senator Lucero, and along with our DFL members, Senator Westland, Umar Verbaden, and Senator Maykoid. I appreciate all the work that all of you have done and the bills that you have brought forward for us. Members, um, per Minnesota Statute 120A.03, there's a mission statement in our state legislature, our, our, our statutes. And the mission says this, the mission of public education in Minnesota, a system for lifelong learning, is to ensure individual academ academic achievement and informed citizenry and high productive workforce. This system focuses on the learner, which is one thing that we were very, very focused on this, this session right from the beginning. The very first day that we held our committee hearing, we heard from over 30 young students who talked to us about um, the good and the bad and the ugly of what was going on in their schools, their school experience, and had plenty of ideas for us. 
So the public school uh, of the state shall serve the needs of students by cooperating with the student's parents, legal guardians to develop the student intellectual capabilities and life work skills in a safe and positive environment. And I think that this bill reflects all of those things. Members, we know that it's no secret that our EK-12 public education system however, remains a work in progress, especially with deep persistence of disturbing opportunity gaps across our state and our country. As I mentioned from our very first committee, I was determined to focus our work on the student, the teacher, and the classroom, bent on building a public education system in Minnesota that takes a comprehensive approach to achieving equity. We invited students from around the state to share their thoughts on the state of education and their voices continue to ring in our ears and guide the work that we've done over these past months. I want to read a quote from Lydia Kennedy. She's a Columbia Heights um, High School student and she summed up much of what we heard. An apparent barrier I've noticed is the lack of funding. This is reflected in the quality of our learning environment. For example, overcrowded classrooms prevent students who need extra attention from receiving the support they need. Funding could provide more teachers and increase space for classes. In many under, underfunded schools, students are not given the opportunity to apply what they've learned in the real world. There are fewer field trips, fewer science fairs. In fact, a lot of them don't have any science fair participation anymore and other options for students to use what they've been taught. Not only are students suffering because of the effects of the pandemic, but so are the teachers. There's been a high turnover of staff, especially social workers. So members, we built this bill with an approach that considers both the instruction of our students and the most urgent conditions that they need in and out of the classroom in order to succeed. The Education Finance Committee has received, had received um, five, 154 bills. We heard 84 of these bills in committee, and many, many of them are in this omnibus bill. This education finance omnibus bill provides historic investments in our schools, our students, and the communities across the state, starting with our very early learners through community ed, all the way through adult basic education. As a retired public school teacher of 25 years, I am committed to prioritizing public education, and today we begin with that goal with unprecedented funding for schools after decades of underinvestment. The billions of dollars spent, on, uh, spent, being, spent being sent to school districts should be applied to reduce those class sizes, to address the opportunity gap, to improve educational outcomes for all students, support our teachers, and provide school districts with the ability to effectively manage their schools. This bill offers a 4% and 5% formula increase that will help to address inflationary pressures on school budgets and provide flexibility that we hear loud and clear for districts to allocate resources where they see that they need them most. Built into this 4 and 5% formula increase is the expectation that 1% of each year's formula will help to cover the unemployment insurance provision. That's $70 per student or $72 million per year to bring our hourly workers in line with other seasonal workers who have, who have been carved out of the unemployment insurance benefits. This bill is finally tackling uncompensated school district costs by paying for a much larger portion of the special education cross subsidy and it begins to address the English learning cross subsidy dollars that will free up funding for districts to focus on classroom size and adequate teacher ratio retention. There's a new aid program that will ensure schools are able to hire mental health experts for students, including counselors, nurses, social workers, and psychologists due to the unprecedented circumstances our students have been through and the expanded need for mental health support. 
The budget addresses gaps in educational outcomes by investing in the READ Act to ensure that every child is reading at proficiency for their grade level, beginning with kindergartners. And we want to make sure that it's evidence-based literacy. We're investing in grow your own programs at different levels that are going to help those schools hire more teachers of color and American Indian teachers, encourage teachers to work in shortage areas, and increase early learning educators. These investments will recruit and retain the great teachers who do the heroic work in our classroom and address the teacher shortage. So these are some of the ways that we plan to do this. We're going to start by defending and recommitting our state to public education. Public schools have been the bedrock of American education system where all students have a fundamental right to high quality education. They have created communities, schools foster social cohesion, and they have remained one of the only sources of mobility for working families across unique backgrounds. This bill recommits our state and this legislature to defending and investing in our public school system from our very earliest learner, include, uh, all the way up to community education and encouraging those lifelong adult learners. We know that research shows that the fastest brain development occurs between birth and age five. Every childhood education, um, early childhood education programs ensure that young children are developing emotionally, socially, and that they are ready to enter kindergarten, all of the components that will lead to future success and improving education outcomes. We start by investing additional dollars to screen three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-old children, or our students each school year. We're doing that by increasing uh, the screening for children at age three from 75 to $98. For our children screened at age four, from $50 to $65. And those children that are screened at age five or six, we're increasing the screening uh, costs from $40 to 52. According to statutory history, the last time that these levels were increased were 2008. This omnibus bill expands access to early education by bolstering and increasing access to early education and childcare programs so that more children are being served and in ensuring that children, all those little children, have a running start before school begins for them. The early education target of $3 million, and that is the vehicle bill that we just passed, um, funds 4,000 permanent pre-kindergarten seats. It makes substantial investments in early education programs through a major increase in early education scholarships. It adds two ECFE support staff at MDE. It expands the eligibility age range to include birth to age three, and it provides funding to combat the early childhood teacher shortage by increasing uh, increases in Grow Your Own and Head Start funding. I want to share a little bit the plan to address early childhood literacy. Each year, this bill budgets close to $8 million in federal and private funding to support AmeriCorps members serving in the Minnesota Schools Reading Corps program. It's established by Serve Minnesota, and these include costs associated with training and teaching early literacy skills to children grades three, excuse me, ages three through grade three, and evaluating the impact of those programs. We heard the evidence of learning with music. Music is an innovative evidence way to promote school readiness and self-regulation skills for young children. So we're funding a music instruction grant through the McPhail Center for Music for their online music instruction program that has the capacity to reach across the great state of Minnesota. We'll be funding Reach Out and Read, which is a Senator Swadzinski bill that establishes a statewide plan to encourage early childhood development through a network of health care clinics, and another of Swad's bill, Parent Child Plus, 
a program that partners with families, caregivers, and communities to support early literacy and school readiness, plus more. Our bill introduced, uh, is, in, is uh, as introduced, has early learning scholarships. These are, this is a bill by our Senator May Quaid, and it allocates over $270 million in the first biennium and $70 million in the second biennium. This is going to help our low-income families with the cost of early care and learning programs and expands the eligibility for scholarships to include all children under the age of five years old in families with income equal to or less than 200% of the federal poverty level in annual income for a family of four. It adds children to the scholarship priority list and it increases appropriation for scholarships, including federally designated Tribal Head Start, Reach Out and Read programs. Every one of our state's children deserves an equal chance to succeed and access to high quality early childhood education and childcare. That child care helps level the playing field so that kids from lower income and middle income homes have uncompromised opportunity to learn and succeed. We were very, very intentional to ensure that our K-12 public education system is providing access to quality education and resources for all students, including the most disadvantaged. We can do this through educator training. This omnibus bill provides targeted funding to school districts for professional development for educators teaching English learners, students with disability, including learning disabilities, foster and homeless youth and other vulnerable populations. For example, we'll be requiring districts to provide training that is evidence-based to all reading intervention teachers and literacy specialists by July 1st, 2025. And to the other teachers in the district, we will be prioritizing elementary school classroom teachers, teachers who work with students with disabilities, English learners, and students who may qualify for the graduation incentive programs. This is all included in the READ Act, again, authored by Senator May Quaid. We're going to compel professional development American Indian student, and we will be um, funding uh, resources for teachers of color and American Indians, graduate courses towards a first master's degree in a field related to their license or towards additional license in the teachers of color and indigenous. Members, if we just remember that we're in the uh, chambers uh, and uh, any disruption uh, is unsettling for the body. So if you would be so mindful of that, that would be great. Senator Kunis, you want to finish Thank up? you. Thank you, Mr. President. And then there are pa uh, funds for our paraprofessional para training. These, this is found in Senator Westland's bill, and it will provide a minimum of 16 hours of paid orientation or professional development to be provided annually to all paraprofessionals, Title I aged, aides, and other instructional staff. We know that we need to collect and report and desegregate any of our K-12 data to help drive our decision making and guide the paths to funding our schools. This data shows important diagnostic information for educators, districts, and legislators so that we can help our students reach their full potential. So we built in a number of reports and requirements to be brought to the legislature every year. So we're going to ask for reports on classroom ratios and how specifically allocated classroom ratio dollars are spent. We're going to ask for a report on unemployment insurance. We're going to um, look for the information that the Office of Inspector General, this is a new office that is being created that will monitor grants and dollars that, that are allocated to programming. The Office of the Inspector General is charged with protecting the integrity of the department and the state 
by detecting and preventing fraud, waste, and abuse in department programs. Beginning with the 2024-25 20, 20, school year, districts are, uh, must report annual data from the prior year about any reasonable force used on a student with a disability or a general education student, student intending to correct or restrain the student in order to prevent imminent body harm or death to us, not death to the student or other that is consistent with the definition of physical holding. We're going to look for information on uh, hiring and dismissals within the school. A school is going to have to annually report to the Professional Educators License and Standards Board all new teacher hires and terminations, including layoffs, and we'd like that desegregated by race and ethnicity and the reason for all teacher resignations and requested leave of absences. As I mentioned earlier, we are looking at the whole child. And one way to do this is through the expansion of wraparound services in our K-12 schools, including, including those that address family engagement, physical, dental, and mental health services, child nutrition, and extended learning opportunities. One way to do this are through community schools. These community schools that we already have here in Minnesota do an excellent job of uniting teachers, families, members of the community, and service providers to address both academic and non-academic needs of students and neighborhoods. This bill is going to provide funding to expand this model statewide. And so we'll be providing $14.5 million for full service community schools to help students succeed in schools and to support healthy families. We do this by integrating uh, student supports that address out of school barriers to learning through partnerships with social and health services and agencies and providers and may include medical, dental, vision and mental health services or counselors to assist with housing issues, transportation, nutrition, immigration, or criminal justice issues. We want to make sure that the dollars that we have already invested in our tribal schools continue to do the good work. So we will continue to invest in American Indian education with aid for eligible district cooperative units or tribal contract schools. Senator Lucero offered uh, one of our bills that allows American Indian aid to be applied from one year to the next. So we want to say miigwech and wopila to him. We also have within this, uh, within this is, are the health services that we will begin providing funding to incentivize schools to provide physical, dental, and mental health services to their students and families. And Senator Hoffman, Senate File 56, expand student support personnel. There's over $49 million in the first biennium and $99 million in the second biennium for aid to support schools in addressing students' social, emotional, and physical health. Senator Swadzinski has another bill that ensures menstrual products are available to students at no cost. And we've already expanded access to child nutrition through the no-cost uh, breakfast and summer meals. We want to be sure that we have welcoming schools that are led by strong leaders. Hey, School Senator Kunis, just for a quick question. Um, are you going to give us a high level, and then we can get others involved to, to answer some questions? Because you have such a wonderful bill, and I just want to make sure that we're able to hear the high points and then get into the amendments. You bet. I'm getting close to the end. Okay. All right. So um, with that, we would like to have uh, strong leaders that are uh, creating welcoming schools and have a healthy environment for all students. So, per the, uh, so one of the ways that we're going to do that um, so that our schools reflect good, positive leadership we're investing in our student principals, our school principals, with support and improvement through culturally responsive leadership practices that create inclusive and respectful teaching and learning environments for all students, families, and employees. One way that we'll do that is to um, put dollars into the National Institute for School Leadership, 
and that, is, um, and that will help the Minnesota Principals Academy fill the gaps by bringing to Minnesota the research-based program, National Institute for School Leadership. We also are ensuring that there are adequate student support personnel aid, um, and that position manages our student support services. Senator Farnsworth has a bill in this omnibus that will um, put dollars towards the historic school building preservation grant for the Hibbing High School that is uh, currently serving secondary kids and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And we looked at levies. So in this bill, Senator Dames has a bill that he's been advocating for for a long time, the long-term facilities maintenance re uh, rent revenue for cooperative and lease levies. We want to make sure that our kids are ready for college and our career um, uh, ready, so we have um, uh, career readiness uh, policies in here. Senator Cruen's Senate File 471 does this by providing grant money to schools to prepare students for emergency medical service certification exam. Um, we are going to have re uh, teacher recruitment marketing campaign that will out, uh, create outreach and marketing that focuses on increasing the interest in teaching in Minnesota public schools, and that is in our high schools. We're going to continue to fund those career and technical aid appropriations. And then lastly, we want to make sure that um, we are addressing an area that has long been overlooked, and those are our um, community ed and ABE schools. For the first time in a long time, we are increasing those rates for those programs so that we can continue to have uh, uh, lifelong learners and our students that, um, uh, that are extended into the school year and ha might have uh, disability have those opportunities. So those are some of the things that we are doing uh, within this omnibus bill. Um, I'm very excited by the, the way that we were able to allocate these dollars, especially when it comes to unique programs. And with that, Mr. President, um, I have completed my overview. Senator oh, I Kunis, do, and then I you. do have the A24 amendment. Uh, Senator Kunis offers the A... 24. 24 amendment, and the secretary will report. Oh, we don't have it at the front desk, Senator uh, Kunish. Uh, you want to double check that number for us? It says A24 on it. Senator, uh, Senator Kunish, if that's truly it, and I have no, no doubt, we could certainly. Um, withdraw your request and then we can go to another and then we can certainly come back to you. Is that okay? Sounds good. All right. Uh, Senator Kroon. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Kunish for chairing the Education Finance Committee. Um, I've enjoyed my time on that committee. And um, one thing that's become clear through the time on the committee is that all of us on that committee have a passion for education. We may disagree on how uh, we achieve that, but I, I appreciate everyone's intentions and their um, passion and advocacy for education. I'd also like to thank Senator Kunish for um, including my bill on opportunities in emergency care. Um, it's a great program that we have in Spring Lake Park, and I look forward to that um, going farther in the state. Um, Mr. President, I would like to offer the A-15 amendment. Senator Kroon offers the A-15 amendment, and the secretary will report the amendment. Senator Kroon moves to amend House File Number 2497 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 5, line 2, strike EL and insert English learner. This is the A-15 amendment. Senator Kroon, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a very simple amendment that just um, is a technical change on page five, line two. 
um, just to remove the abbreviation of EL and replace it uh, with English learner just so that we're being um, accurate and formal in our uh, headings in statute. Um, and then I would also, Mr. President, like to offer the A16 amendment to the amendment. Senator Cruden offers the A16 amendment, which is an amendment to the amendment, and the Secretary will report the A16 amendment to the amendment. Senator Kroon moves to amend the A15 amendment to House File Number 2497 as follows. Page 1, after line 4, insert. This is the A16 amendment to the amendment. Senator Kroon, to your A16 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, one thing on the uh, Education Finance Committee this year, there was a lot of talk about um, cross-subsidies. And um, being on the school board up until January uh, in Spring Lake Park, I was very familiar with cross-subsidies, but I quickly realized that a lot of people don't know what that means. And simply, it's when the state um, imposes a mandate on local school districts but does not fund that mandate, uh, the schools then have to um, use general fund dollars to pay for those uh, requirements, and that is what we create uh, call uh, creates a cross subsidy. Um, and in this bill, Mr. President, um, there will be at least one new cross subsidy created. Um, but there is um, we are addressing some of the cross subsidies in this bill, and I'm thankful for that, such as the special education cross subsidy and the English learner cross subsidy. But there is one, um, Mr. President, that we are not addressing, and one that I talked about quite a bit in the uh, in committee, and that is the transportation cross subsidy. Um, and what this amendment does, Mr. President, is it increases the school transportation sparsity aid. And the language in this amendment is from Senate File 319, which was authored by Senator Housechild and co-authored by Senator Housley and myself. And for the most part, current funding formulas do not recognize the actual transportation costs of districts, but rather make general assumptions of what districts spend on average for transportation and build that into the, uh, their per pupil uh, funding formula for transportation. And so a district with unique transportation challenges, for example, um, traveling around large bodies of water or um, traveling extremely long distances with few pupils, um, is eligible for transportation sparsity aid, but that funding is wholly inadequate, um, and that district must dig into its general fund to cover uh, the transportation fund deficit, um, creating the cross-subsidy. This amendment would help correct that situation by increasing transportation sparsity aid to those districts with unique transportation challenges. Um, and with so many cross-subsidies existing, I know we can't el eliminate them all, um, and the cost of this amendment, Mr. President, is $33.5 million in the first biennium and $48 million in the tails. And this cost then to make this even would be taken from um, the substantial progress that we're making on the EL cross-subsidy, which is another very important cross-subsidy that must be addressed. But even after taking this out of the EL, uh, this new EL funding, EL will still see a significant increase of over $100 million in 24-25. Uh, $200 million in the tails. And there are many cross-subsidies that we need to address, and um, I think to entirely exclude one of these cross-subsidies from the equation in this bill uh, doesn't seem right. Um, Mr. President, the city of Columbus is in my district, and Columbus is in the Forest Lake School District. Columbus is a relatively small city from a population standpoint, but a very large city from a geographical standpoint. The Carlos Avery State Wildlife Management Area is in Columbus. There are lakes and wetlands that cut right through the middle of the city and make school transportation very expensive. Buses have to drive all the way around these lakes and around the entire city uh, to go down long roads to pick up just one student and then travel very long distances again to pick up another student. And with rising gas prices and inflation, this issue is making transportation extremely difficult for Forest Lake schools. Forest Lake uh, schools has nearly a half million dollar deficit in their transportation sparsity funding. Um, their transportation costs exceed their transportation budget that the state gives them by, like I said, nearly half a million dollars. And so, uh, Mr. President, yes, this bill does increase um, the general formula and makes progress on some of the other cross-subsidies. And you could say, well, 
that's more funding, so you can put some of that towards your transportation issues. Um, but the math just doesn't work for Forest Lake schools and a lot of other districts. Under the bill, they're set to receive approximately $4.8 million, but they, they estimate that the additional unfunded mandates required under this bill and other bills that are working their way through the legislature will greatly exceed that number. So to help these districts with the unusually high transportation costs is appropriate and will be appreciated. And I ask this body for a yes vote. Thank you. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is policy that I have been working on since I got here in 2013. Uh, the transportation funding formula was created in the 70s. Created in the 70s and what it didn't take into account was how far a bus has to travel to pick up the kids. It just takes into account the number of students. Uh, and so when you've got a district like Forest Lake, like Senator Cruen said, uh, those bus drivers drive approximately 200 million miles, or 200 miles, and buses travel, yeah, 2 million miles a year. Those school bus drivers dri uh, drive 2 million miles a year. Uh, and districts with similar enrollments, uh, but a significantly less amount of students, receive the same amount of per pupil funding, even though their transportation costs are a lot less. And so what does a district like Forest Lake do? Uh, well, they have to take that money out of the general fund. And when you take the money out of the general fund, that means they have to cut staff, which means the classroom sizes have to get bigger, and they also have to cut their curriculum. There'll be no band or there'll be no... Uh, art class, they, uh, no foreign language class. Um, and so because of that deficit, it's not equal. So the transportation sparsity uh, was changed a little bit ago, but they still only get 18.2%. So I want to thank Senator Cruen uh, for something that I've been working a long, long time on, and uh, we just keep inching our way up there. I know the House has it in their bill for 40%, but really hoping that to help these kids in these districts and help these districts be able to afford their curriculum and their staff um, to get it to 70%. So thank you, Senator Kruin, and I encourage a green vote also. Senator Kunis. To the A15, excuse me, the A16 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. So this is not uh, new information to us. We, we heard this, and in fact, uh, at the very beginning of the, school, of the session, um, I had a bill that would do a little supplemental budget that would address specifically EL, special ed, and transportation. And unfortunately, I couldn't get the other two uh, bodies to, uh, to agree to it. Um, I recognize that our schools uh, are really struggling with these transportation issues, especially uh, with the high cost of gasoline and the cost, um, especially in greater Minnesota. I grew up in a very rural community where uh, the farm wives drove the buses during the school year and parked their buses out in, in the, the barns to keep them warm over, their, over winter. And um, the thought of, of the schools really struggling with this is, oh, is very much on my mind. So it's not that we hadn't thought about it. We felt that this, uh, this session we would focus on the most urgent of urgent, uh, even though those transportation costs are there and we recognize it. And so um, with this amendment, um, I would ask members to vote no and keep the EL subsidy intact. Uh, with the House having um, some kind of transportation subsidy, uh, I would be willing to look at what they are suggesting and see what, it, what happens within um, conference coming up. And if that isn't uh, good enough, then we will look at this next year, uh, next session. Senator Kupik. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd ask for a roll call vote. Roll call, request a roll call granted. Any other speakers before I go to the author of the amendment? Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Kunish worked really hard on this bill to address the English language learner cross subsidy, which would have been reduced by 75% in 2026. This amendment is taking um, funds away from that. 
Um, and I think our English language learners in our schools deserve better. I, I encourage you to vote no. Any other discussion before we go to the author of the amendment? Seeing none, Senator Kuhn. Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to request a roll call um, on this amendment. A roll call was requested and a roll call was granted. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I appreciate that Senator uh, Kunish will, will look into this. Hopefully there is an opportunity um, um, to include this uh, in conference committee, uh, depending on what the other body does. Uh, and I look forward to uh, hopefully getting some relief on this transportation issue. This, this issue is coming to a, to a head in Forest Lake. Um, they're having a very, very difficult time uh, with their transportation um, budget right now. And so this is urgent for Forest Lake. And then, Mr. President, like I said, um, I, I'm not downplaying the importance of the English learner cross-subsidy. I think we need to work on all of our cross-subsidies. Um, but like I noted before, um, even with this amendment, that would still be funded over $100 million in this biennium and over $200 million in the next biennium. And I just I don't think it's fair to entirely exclude one of these cross-subsidies. Having said that, Mr. President, if there's a, you know, as we go forward and as we work together, if there's a, a, a different area that would be more appropriate to, uh, to the chair and those on the conference committee um, to take that money from to uh, get this transportation uh, money, I would be certainly welcome that as well. So I appreciate um, the conversation, Mr. President, and I encourage a yes vote. Thank you. The secretary would take the roll on the A16 amendment to the amendment. Members, please vote. Senator Murphy, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Rust votes no. Senator Rust votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Members, please vote. Senator Murphy, are you planning to vote? Senator McEwen, are you planning to vote? Senator Nelson, are you planning to vote? Or are you thinking about it? No problem. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Drehan votes aye. Senator Drehan votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 31 ayes and 35 noes, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Members, as a friendly reminder, we are now on the underlining A15 amendment. Senator Kroon? In, oh, oh, no, I want to go to uh, Senator Kupik. And, and if nobody asked for a roll call on this one, Mr. President, I'll ask for roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any other discussion on the A15 before we go to the uh, author? Um, Seeing none, Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I appreciate the discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Um, and given the result of that, Mr. President, I withdraw the underlying amendment. Senator Kroon withdraws the A15 amendment. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I will offer the A13 amendment and the A14 amendment to the amendment. Senator Lucero offers the A13 amendment. Uh, first, we've got to have the uh, secretary report the A13 amendment. Senator Lucero moves to amend House file number 2497 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 155, line 26, after appropriated, insert a comma. This is the A13 amendment. Senator Lucero also offers the A14 amendment, which is an amendment to the amendment, and the secretary will report the A14 amendment, which is an amendment to the amendment. Senator Lucero moves to amend the A13 amendment to House file number 2497 as follows. Page one after line three, insert. This is the A14 amendment to the A13 amendment. 
Uh, student, Senator Lucero, on your A14 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to start by thanking Senator Kunesh and members of the Senate Education Finance Committee for the privilege of serving on that committee here in my first term in the Senate. As I've spoken on the floor multiple times, education, as a former educator myself, education is an incredible passion of mine personally, and it is one that I have been fighting for my entire time in office, both in the previous body and in this body. I've had many conversations with members over those years during this time on this topic, and one of the highlights that I've been trying to bring forth is the very unfortunate reality that one of the school districts in my community, St. Michael Albertville, STMA, has consistently for years and years and years been at the very bottom of the per pupil educational formula. This has created an incredible hardship for parents in my community, for teachers in my community, for the students in my community. It has resulted in larger class sizes. It has resulted in many, many good teachers and other staff being laid off. It has resulted in educational opportunities being denied for students in my community that their peer students in other communities continue to have access to. And so I offer this amendment. It is currently my Senate file 505 that I've converted into an amendment and I'm offering today because there are many good students in my community and across the state that are gonna benefit from this, this amendment. What it does is it targets disparity aid at the bottom 20% of those school districts across the state. Now there are reasons for districts across the state being in the bottom 20%. Among those is low property wealth and other attributes, other causes. So this amendment seeks to assist schools at the bottom 20% of educational funding Disparity aid will help bring these districts up to where that 20% amount is currently measured. The total cost of this amendment is $56 million in the first biennium and $41 million in the tails. So in the grand scheme of the totality of the budget in this bill, this is, is not an overwhelming amount. It's not an insurmountable amount. But this amount would benefit greatly my community and communities across the state. I pay for it within the bill by pulling money from the MDE operating adjustment increase, the equity, diversity, and inclusion staff increase at education, at the education department, and from the English learner aid. And I will conclude my remarks with this, Mr. President. Again, I, I very much appreciate the many conversations we've had on the committee. I appreciate Senator Kunish's comments to me, both in the committee and privately that when we've met. I've very much appreciated all the conversations I've had, Senator Swadzinski, Senator Mayquaid, and others. This is a topic that is bipartisan. It is a challenge that is bipartisan. It's impacting Republicans and Democrats alike. And it's one that I'm hoping that members will support as we target funding at the consistently bottom 20% of school districts across the state because it should not matter what a student's zip code is when educational opportunities are being decided for all of our children. So members, and Mr. President, members, I would ask for a roll call vote. Roll call request or roll call granted. Senator Kunish. We are on the A14 amendment to the amendment. Mr. President, thank you. 
so yes, yeah, Senator Lucero brought this to me and uh, we had a really good discussion about it. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic and empathetic to uh, the situation. Uh, these are our school districts, as Senator Lucero mentioned, that have that low property tax, but there are a number of them that also um, have refused to authorize any kind of referendum or um, extra funding to their, to their own school districts. And I recognize the strain and the stress that this is on individual families, aging communities, and that, uh, that sort of thing. And I made him the promise that we would look at the this next year. Uh, right now, we have, uh, we have, well, we have a, uh, a, a, a good chunk of money to work with. Um, we feel that the allocations that we have already created, and of course, this came to me a little bit later in the in session. And so, members, I would ask that you vote no on this with the understanding that this will become um, uh, one of those items on our to-do list for next year. Any further discussion on the A14 amendment to the amendment? Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the um, amendment is also taking money from the English, ling English language learner cross-subsidy. I hope this doesn't become a pattern. Um, again, our English language learners deserve better. I encourage you to vote this amendment down. Any further discussion before we go to the author of the amendment? Seeing none, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll just highlight a few more data points. Each of us has the runs before us, and you will, I would draw your attention to St. Michael Albertville School District 885. And if you go across all the way to the furthest right-hand column, you would see that the per pupil increase for STMA is going to be $586 under the bill before us per student. Compare that to the $782 per student increase that this bill is going to, to bring. It is woefully deficient. So in other words, STMA is going to receive approximately $200 less per student increase under this bill it further exacerbates the existing problem. I would also mention that I've highlighted this is a bipartisan bill. I'll highlight just a few of the districts that are gonna benefit from this to uh, demonstrate that it is certainly bipartisan. And I am, I've highlighted here those that are our Democrat districts that are gonna benefit. So the Sauk Rapids School District is going to see increase in funding represented by Senators Howe, West, Westberg, and Putnam. The Barnesville School District is Senator Kupek. The Howley School District will benefit from this, Representative Kupek. I, the Pine Island School District, partially represented by Senator Bolden. The Hermantown School District would benefit by this amendment, represented by Senator Housechild. The Proctor School District, represented by Senators Housechild and McEwen. The Prior Lake Shakopee District, represented by Senator Port, and the Dilworth Glyden School District, represented by Senator Kupek. Again, this is a, a good amendment. I do appreciate the remarks from Senator Kunesh that, that we'll look at this next year. This is something that I've, I've brought to the committee. It was one of the first bills I introduced, hence the, the Senate file number 505, asking for committee hearings immediately unfortunately did not get a committee hearing. The, the children in our school district in STMA and across the state can no longer wait. Every year it's a let's wait, let's discuss, let's look at this next year, let's look at this next year. This is a critical issue for students across the state and members, please vote green for our children. Thank you. The secretary will take the roll on the A14 amendment to the amendment.
Members, please vote. Senator Murphy, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Draheim votes aye. Senator Draheim votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes aye. And Senator Western votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, there being 35 ayes and 32 noes, the amendment to the amendment is adopted. We are now on the underlining A13 amendment as amended. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I am very pleased with that, and I would just ask for a roll call vote on the underlying amendment as well. Thank you. Any discussion on the underlying amendment? Sin, are you wanting to speak? Uh, Senator Kunish. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Lucero stand for a question? Senator Lucero, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Kunish. Senator Lucero, what does this bill do, or this amendment do? Senator Lucero. The amendment as amended will take the language that we just voted upon and it will also insert, let me pull that up because I put my paperwork away, the original amendment on line, on page 155 of line 26, after the word appropriated, it would add a comma. Senator uh, Kunis, to, uh, well, it's back to you, Senator Kunis. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would accept that amendment. Should we still keep the roll call? There's a roll call on the uh, bill. Uh, who was the one that offered, uh, uh, who moved the roll call? Was it Lucero? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Just make sure I'm clear if, if Senator Kunish would yield for a question. I will. She will yield. Uh, Senator Lucero. Did, I, I was still shuffling my paperwork. Did I hear that she will accept the amendment as amended? Yes. Yes, uh, Senator Lucero. Yes. That being the case, Mr. President, I will yes. withdraw the roll call. Uh, uh, roll call withdrawn. Um, Mr. President. Did I hear someone? Oh, Senator Marty. Mr. President, Senator Kunis, you didn't like the amendment that was just added on to this. Do you now want to accept it in this? Senator Kunis. Beg your pardon, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to uh, withdraw that positive. I was looking at the wrong line of the um, bill, and so once again, I beg your pardon, and I will not accept this amend uh, amendment Mr. to the President. amendment. Uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I will re-ask for a roll call on the amendment as amended. Roll call requested, roll call granted. The, the, um, uh, the secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Murphy, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator uh, Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Don't forget to vote, but I'll, I'll replay my votes right now. Senator Drayheim votes aye. Senator Coran votes aye. No, I said Senator Drayheim. I'm sorry. Go back. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes aye. And Senator Western votes aye. Uh, 
All senators having voted who, desi who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 32 noes, the amendment is adopted. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I will offer the A-17 amendment. Senator Lucero offers the A-17 amendment, and the secretary will report the A-17 amendment. Senator Lucero moves to amend House File Number 2497 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 124, line 29, before school, insert public. This is the A-17 amendment. Senator Lucero, to your A-17 amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I will also offer the A-18 amendment to the amendment. Senator Lucero offers the A-18 amendment to the amendment, and the secretary will report the A-18 amendment to the amendment. Senator Lucero moves to amend the A-17 amendment to House File Number 2497 as follows. Page 1 after line 4, insert. This is the A-18 amendment to the A-17 amendment. Senator Lucero, to your A-18 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President, and I will ask for a roll call vote on both. Roll call uh, requested, roll call granted on both the A-18 amendment to the amendment as well as the A-17 amendment. Senator Lucero, to your A-18 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. And as I have referenced several times on the floor before, my profession is cybersecurity. It is my job to protect valuable assets against harm. There is no more valuable asset than our children. Minnesota state statute already recognizes this with language in law that protects children and requires internet filters to screen out and prevent access for obscene material. And I'll, I'll read from a portion of existing law. When it comes to internet or other digital forms of content and material, there is a requirement that the, the filter and restricted access is in place by the school district for content that is reasonably believed to be obscene or child pornography or materials harmful to minors under federal or state law. What this amendment to the amendment seeks to do is it, the, 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 the language in law for digital forms of obscene content, apply that to physical content. And so as you can see, it is working to prevent access to harmful material uh, to minors under federal and state law. So again, it's not only digital forms of obscene material, but also physical forms. And I would ask for a green vote, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Senator um, Kunis to, oh, I'm sorry. Senator McQuay, Senator McQuay to the, um, to the A18 amendment to the amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. President and members. So um, for those of you who are not on the Education Finance Committee, this is something that came up in the Education Finance Committee. Um, and Senator Lucero is right, Mr. President. We do already have this language in law uh, to protect from online uh, materials that could be obscene or child pornography. What this amendment would do is it insinuates that there is obscene material in our school libraries, which there is not, Mr. President. We have highly qualified, accomplished librarians, media specialists, support staff that call and go through materials that are appropriate developmentally, um, literacy levels for our young people in our schools. And so this, I believe, is not only uh, needed or necessary, but I do believe, Mr. President, that this is not the kind of message that we want to send to our media specialists and our librarians and our support staff in school, that we think that this is something that they are doing, that they need this in law in order to have uh, good materials in our library. So members, I would encourage you to vote no. Any further discussion before we get to the author? Senator Kupik or anyone? Yes, Mr. President, I believe he already asked for a roll call on okay. both, so. That okay. is correct. Any other discussion before we go to the author? 
Senator Kunis, did you have a, a, a word? I want to make sure that I'm giving you a chance. Thanks, you, Mr. President. I was just waiting to see if anybody else had comments. Um, I can tell you right now that school districts already do this. So this is a, a, an amendment that is unnecessary. As a library media specialist, we um, were responsible working with our IT folks to ensure that, that there were filters, that uh, any of the software that the students were using um, had those filters on there to prevent uh, any access to um, any of these um, disturbing websites or materials. Um, as far as uh, any kind of non um, technology items. Uh, as Senator Maquaid said, as a licensed library media specialist, we uh, have training and we have continual training on the, uh, the different ways to look and, re and uh, review and uh, look at the resources that we are putting into our schools, whether they're for the classroom, for the library, uh, or whether they're in our computer labs. And so, uh, members, I would ask you to vote no on this. We already are doing these in our schools, and uh, I don't feel this is at all necessary at this time. Any other discussion before we go to Senator Lucero, who is the author of the amendment? Seeing down, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And this is not to disparage any school staff at all. As I mentioned, I'm in the cybersecurity industry. There are very good professionals across all types of entities in our state, government, private sector, nonprofits, et cetera. And to, ins to, to make a statement that adding additional protections somehow is disparaging against current staff is absolutely wrong. It is already recognized that uh, there is obscene material out there harmful for children, hence the reason why current statute already seeks to protect them when that harmful content is in digital form. But as we know, Mr. President, those evil actors that are targeting our children with obscene material are not limited to only avenues of the internet. It should be in all forms. If it is a true statement, Mr. President and members, that schools are already doing this, then this language won't change anything. It doesn't add additional cost. This language simply takes the existing language in law and also, also applies it to the other forms that are not exclusively internet or digital based. There should be no controversy for, with that. Taking existing protections and making sure that it is in all areas. And I'll read the verbiage. A school library within a school site must restrict all student access to material that is reasonably believed to be obscene or child pornography or material harmful to minors under federal or state law. That's not controversial. Mr. President, let's protect our children. And we can do so by voting green on this Amendment to the amendment. Thank you. The secretary will give, excuse me, the secretary will take the roll. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. And Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. 
Thank you, Mr. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. All senators having voted, who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 38 ayes and 29 noes, the amendment to the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we are now on the A-17 amendment as amended. Senator Lucero, I'm going to wait to see if there's anyone else who wants to speak before we listen to you as our last speaker as the author. Senator uh, Kunish. Uh, Mr. President, I will accept this amendment. So members, you may vote green. Uh, Senator Lucero, we are fine. All, the, all in favor say aye. There was a roll call on this. Oh, there was a roll call? If not, I'll ask for the roll call. Okay, roll call request or roll call granted. I didn't see it on the board. That's only because sometimes I can't see things. Anyway, with that being sta stated, the secretary will take the roll on the A-17 am amendment as amended. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voted under Rule 40.7. Thank, Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Desick votes aye. Senator Desick votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Rust votes aye. Senator Rust votes aye. And Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes aye. And Senator Western votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 60 ayes and six noes. The amendment, as amended, is adopted. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I'm enjoying this uh, discussion here. And um, I've, uh, I think it was 2001, maybe, that I was privileged to uh, try to help some teachers out that I was representing, and they were frustrated with their pensions. And as a member of the other body, we managed to pass out of the House uh, that body the uh, Rule of 90. And the Senate at that time would not take it. Mr. President, I hope today is the day that we can take it. Mr. President, I offer the fifth A51 amendment. Senator Abler offers the A51 amendment. The secretary will report the A51 amendment. Senator Abler moves to amend House File Number 2497 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 93 after line 18, insert. This is the A51 amendment. Senator Abler to the A51 amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I, um, you know, I met a bunch of the Tier 2 teachers compared to the Tier 1 teachers. And the Tier 1 teachers, the Tier 2s don't feel quite as good as the Tier 1s. Uh, and they just would like to have their, their due. And I could not be more eager about that. And the good news is it doesn't blow up the budget agreement because it starts on July 1st of 2027. I urge a green vote. Thank you. Any discussion on the A51? Uh, Senator Kupik. Mr. President, I request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any additional discussion? Senator Kunish. Members, this is, this is a new bill for me. This is a bill that I have not seen. Um, I certainly can't read all six pages and understand it in the, the minute or so that we have here. Uh, I also uh, recognize how important it is that we are uh, supporting and investing in our teachers as they uh, go through those years and years of working hard with our students and uh, bringing them into uh, a, a workforce that is um, valued and uh, they are a contributing member. 
but uh, I'm going to assume that this has a pretty pricey uh, tag to it. And as I said, I have no idea what's in here. I don't have time to digest it. Uh, and so, members, I would ask you to vote no um, with the understanding that um, pensions is, are also not in my jurisdiction. And so this would actually uh, be out of order if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. But if that's not the case, then um, members, I ask you to vote no. Point of order, Senator, Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. President. I agree with Senator Kunesh that this is an issue before the Pensions uh, Committee of this Senate, and relates to a substantially different subject and topic than the bill under question today. So I would raise a point of order under 35.2 and ask you to rule the amendment out of order. Mr. President, advice, 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 Senator Abler. Well, holy cow, Mr. President, this bill spends $6 billion, um, a lot of which will go to the supporting of our schools and teacher pay and paraprofessionals and, and all sorts of things. There could be nothing more germane to this bill than this pensions um, project here. And even though it, it is uh, in the beyond the budget horizon, it does not blow up the targets. And we already have a custom of using below past the horizon monies. We've spent a billion and a half dollars out of the healthcare access fund, which will push past the 27 horizon. We spent about $250 million out of the insurance, uh, reinsurance fund, which will push spending out beyond the horizon, not considered. So, Mr. President, if we're under that, we should absolutely, this is really important and it's something we absolutely should do. And Mr. President, you know, as you rule, I just want to remind the body, they have a chance to actually do this today. So, thank you. Senator Pappas, advice. Um, thank you, Mr. President. More advice. Um, I would agree that this is totally not germane to an education finance bill. There's nothing in the education finance bill that says anything whatsoever about pensions. It'd be more relevant, um, Senator Abler, to the pensions bill. Senator uh, Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Why rise in favor? of this bill. Uh, I will tell you, this is the uh, number Senator, one thing uh, I hear uh, Nelson, from Senator. Are you rising in favor of the bill or the oh, amendment? Excuse me. I am uh, in favor of the amendment that it is germane, Mr. President. The reason I believe it's germane is we have the education bill in front of us that uh, deals with students, teachers, and our schools. And I want to be clear, as a member of the Pensions Committee, uh, and uh, having had meetings in my districts the last few Saturdays, this is the number one thing. Teachers come to my meetings and say, we need this. It's germane because it's germane to what teachers are asking for. There's a, it, a shortage of our teachers. I encourage um, that this is a germane uh, amendment. H having re received advice from the body as well as from the uh, staff, uh, Senator Klein's point is well taken. Mr. President, I appeal Sen the ruling, your magnificent ruling of the president, but I want to be sure that people know that I don't agree with the ruling. I request the roll call, please. Roll call requested, roll call granted. That's already part of the process under Rule 14.4. Members, uh, just so that you know, if you start debating uh, something, it, it, it will bypass your right to an appeal. But I'm not doing that today. I'm just giving you a friendly reminder. An appeal from the decision of the president must be made immediately after your ruling. Um, and the question before the body is, shall the decision of the president be the judgment of the Senate? That's, that's uh, pursuant to Senate Rule 14.4. A green vote upholds the decision of the president. A red vote to overrule the decision of the president. The secretary will take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. And Senator Latz votes aye. And Senator Latz votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes no. And Senator Western votes no. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 36 ayes and 31 noes, the decision of the president is upheld. Any additional amendments? Senator Kunish. Mr. President, I um, offer the A54 amendment. Senator Kunis offers the A54 amendment. The secretary will report the A54 amendment. Senator Kunis moves to amend the A18 amendment to House File, to House file Number 2497, adopted by the Senate April 24, 23, as follows. Page 1, line 5, delete A. This is the A54 amendment. Senator Kunis, to your amendment. Um, Mr. President, this bill simply references the state statute 125B.15 uh, in opposition to um, inserting it. Roll call requested. Yes, please. A roll call requested, roll call granted. Any other discussions on the A54 amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. And Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Jasinski, those uh, voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, one moment, please. I'm sorry? One, one minute, moment. please. Mr. President? Uh, you, no speaking during a vote, uh, 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 Senator. OK. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.5. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator 40.7. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes no. Senator Western votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 40 ayes and 27 noes. The amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Mr. President. Uh, I'm sorry, is adopted. Mr. President. One moment, and then I'll recognize you. Members, you probably heard me when I was talking, when uh, Senator Anderson asked a question. This is just a friendly reminder that when we are under a roll call and the, the members are voting under Rule 40.5, a roll call vote may not be interrupted except to announce the vote of a member voting remotely as, prov as provided under our, uh, our rules or to close the roll as provided in Rule 41.3. 
That's just a gentle reminder so that you don't think I was just trying to be rude to Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson. Mr. President, uh, you called the roll on this last amendment, and the amendment wasn't on my computer yet. I didn't even have it up on the screen to even look at it. So I, I think it would behoove the President to go slower in calling the roll on some of these so at least the screen will portray what the amendment is so we understand what we're having brought before us. So I members, that. just so you know, if you don't see something on the screen because we went so slow, I'm, I'm surprised that you're not calling me a turtle. Listen, when you, uh, when you don't see something on the screen, just please just raise your hand because we have paused and slowed down in order to make sure that individuals are able to see it on the screen. So point well taken, Senator Anderson. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, point of parliamentary procedure. Um, as I understand this amendment that we just voted on, it was actually an amendment to an amendment, and we did not have the underlying amendment in front of us. That had already been done. Um, did we follow the correct procedure in adopting this last amendment. Yes, that was only an amendment. It was not an amendment to an amendment. And I know you saw that on the board, but it was an amendment from my understanding because it was Senator Kunish's amendment. Mr. Pre further inquiry, Mr. President. Senator Rear. Um As I look at the language of this, it was to page one uh, and lines. So that cannot be to the bill, the underlying bill. It had to have been an amendment to an amendment. So let me double check that ju just to make sure. Just for clarity, Senator Rick, thank you. Uh, but uh, this was drafted to the previously adopted A18, which the body had already adopted. So it, it technically was, um, was drafted to that, but that underlying amendment had already been adopted. So it, it, it should have functioned more like an amendment because it was, because the, the underlying A18 was already, um, uh, it, it, uh, accepted by this body. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So further inquiry, uh, would not the proper procedure have been to reconsider the underlying amendment so that was actually in front of the body? Because that after having adopted it, it would have been to other pages of the bill, and thus if we're adopting amended language, it should have been to the page of the bill where that language had been readopted. Uh, Senator Rarick, I have an opinion about it, but let me just double check with staff. Mr. President, advice? No advice at this time. Here's my understanding that because we do not engross in real time, you sometimes have to draft it to the previous amendment that was passed already by the, the body, according to, uh, uh, to staff. Senator Rarick, uh, thank you. Will, uh, I'm, I'm trying to move us forward, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but if there's anything else that we need to modify, we will certainly talk to you about it. But that's after, as you can see, so many conversations about this. And they all said the same thing. So Senator Rarick. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that. Um, I think if we have something like that, I would, uh, uh, in the future, um, I think we were not under the understanding that that was an amendment to the amendment, and we really didn't have time to get a full grasp of what was being voted on. So uh, thank you for indulging, Mr. President. So what I will do in the future about that, because that is true, that we should have said, here's what you see on the board, and just so you understand the process, because sometimes when you see something on the board, you really do think that there's an underlining amendment that is before the body. So with that being said, 
Uh, Senator, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the clarification. And just one other point to, to help us go uh, maybe a little faster uh, is maybe though start, starting just a bit slower. And it was difficult for those of us who do not have Statute 125B memorized uh, to get to that and see what that statute was. And so I would ask that our members uh, at least address their amendment and say what it does, what's the meaning of it, so we can at least get to it and look at what the, sta what the statute that's being changed does. Thank you, Mr. President. And just in fairness, I do believe that Senator Kunish did talk about the amendment, uh, and I'm not certain if she talked about it in enough detail, but that will be certainly something that members can ask in the event that you see something on an amendment and if you didn't have an opportunity to hear a, a, a long enough explanation about it. We will certainly make sure that members are able to do that. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And I don't know what the a proper motion is, but I've got uh, uh, some people working on that. But what this comes down to is I believe what just happened is not an order. And allow me to explain. Uh, hold so, on, you, uh, uh, start over one more time, that you believe it didn't what? The vote that was just taken was not in order for a number of reasons, and I'll explain why. A, a few minutes ago, I offered the A-17 amendment. And then subsequent to that, I offered the A-18 amendment to the amendment. My, uh, my A-18 amendment to the amendment was the amendment on the topic of uh, extending the same language in digital harmful content to physical. That amendment to the amendment was adopted, and then the subsequent A-17 as amended was adopted. So my original A-18 was an amendment to the amendment. The Kunish amendment that I'm looking at here is seeking to amend my A18. The original A18 is an amendment to the amendment. So the Kunish A54 amendment seeking to undo what was just passed and roll back extending protections of harmful content is out of order because it is a, you can't offer an amendment to an amendment to an amendment first and foremost, and that's what her amendment attempts to do. Second, the underlying A17 was not before the body. So even if it's gonna be attempt to be convoluted to say that the A54 Kunish Amendment was attempting to amend the A17, that's not what it says. But the A17 there nonetheless was not before the body, so she would not be able to offer an A54 Amendment attempting to amend the A17. So therefore, the entire ordeal that just happened, and therefore the vote that just happened, is out of order. So Senator Lucero, let me go slow enough so that we all can understand it. If there's something that needs to be corrected, the, the parties, uh, uh, the staff, and others around will help. You put forth an A-17 amendment. Then you offered the A-18 amendment to the amendment. The A18 amendment to uh, the A18 amendment to the amendment was adopted. That th then we were on the underlining A17. So the A17 was adopted as amended. So even if you, even if we listen to your logic, then uh, then the only thing that would have been before the body would have been the the, the, the A-17, but the A-17 as amended was already acted on as well as the amendment to the amendment was acted on. So once that was done, that was done. And we do not engross in real time. So they are not in succession with each other. And so that is how that occurred. That, that has been what, what the body has uh, said. And so if you look at the A-54, is to the A18 amendment, which was acted on by the body, and we do not engross in real time. So it's been acted on appropriately. So now, if you want me to rule on this, I will rule on it, and, 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 and then we can go from there. Uh, Senator Pratt, if you give me one second, because I want to see, if, see what uh, Secretary Bodner is saying. Uh, appropriately so. So, uh, uh, Senator Lucero, if you're making a point of order, please cite the rule uh, and where in Masons that, uh, that you want me to rule from. It's a point of parliamentary inquiry, Mr. President. When you do it a point of parliamentary inquiry, you have to do it in rule. 
And so if there's a rule that you want me to cite to, or that you want to cite to, I'll certainly look at it and rule. I have a point of parliamentary inquiry. That's a point of par So you're asking for the status of sub, sub, something? Correct. So, uh, so no, I'm asking for the, uh, I have a so, parliamentary inquiry. So you're asking for the status of where, where we are, and I believe that I answered the status and where we are. So unless you have a different question as it, as it pertains to the status, because I went through the A, A17, the A18, and then the subsequent uh, A54. Now, if there's something different, I'll be happy to hear. Mr. But, President, but, I have a point of parliamentary it, inquiry, which is not regarding the status of anything. It's a parliamentary inquiry, which would be a parliamentary inquiry is in order on any topic of parliamentary procedure. And so no, my cite, point, I have an inquiry. Cite the rule. I have a point of parliamentary inquiry, Mr. President. But, but cite the rule that you're coming from. You want Where? me to cite the rule I, in I Masons that, that is speaking to a point of parliamentary inquiry? Yes. I Mr. don't have that. I don't have Masons in front of so me. So I will give. I'll give you a second, and then I'll go to Senator Pratt, and I'll be happy to come back to you. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I have a parliamentary inquiry under Mason Section 408. Hold on one second, Senator Pratt. I'll give you a second. Okay, uh, Senator Pratt, amendments to the amendment. Thank section you, Mr. President. My parliamentary inquiry is, Mason Section 408 says an amendment may be amended, but an amendment to an amendment may not be amended. And so my parliamentary inquiry, Mr. President, is along the lines of what Senator Lucero has been bringing up. The A18 was an amendment to the amendment, and it was adopted into the A17. By rule, an amendment to the amendment may not be adopted. And therefore, it was the A-17 that was actually adopted, not the A-18. Because the A-18 amended the A-17. And under Rule 408, or Section 408, you may not amend an amendment to the amendment. And I'm just wondering how that comports in the parliamentary inquiry is how can the A54 then be in order? Thank you, Senator Pratt. If you hold on a minute, I will inquire further. Senator Pratt, thank you so much for your inquiry. Um, uh, here's how we are looking at this. So the amendment to the amendment became a part of the bill. That was the A18 as well as the A17. So it was no longer an amendment to the amendment at that time once it, is, uh, once it becomes a part of the bill because we do not do engrossing in real time. So when the A54 came forward, it was not an amendment to the amendment as a third amendment uh, or, 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 or the Third Amendment removed as you, as you look at under Section 408. So that is what happened. So, uh, Senator Crude, and I don't mind being here all day because I love this. Uh, uh, Farnsworth, I'm sorry. Senator Farnsworth. Mr. President, point of uh, parliamentary inquiry. Uh, having voted on the prevailing side, would it be in order for me to request that we reconsider this? You can always vote to re, uh, you can move to reconsider because you vote, voted on the prevailing side. So, it, so if you want to vote, if uh, you want a, a motion, if it's your motion to reconsider, we could certainly uh, put that before the body. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so since there seems to be a ton of confusion about this and most of the people didn't know exactly what they were voting on, having voted on the prevailing side of that amendment, I move to reconsider. Uh, re reconsider adoption of the A54 amendment, is that right? 
Yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Kroon, having vo uh, 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 Farnsworth, I'm sorry, having voted on the pervading side, Senator uh, Farnsworth moved that the vote hereby uh, the A54 amendment to, uh, to House File 2497 uh, was adopted on April 24, 2023, be now reconsidered. That, so that's the motion before the body. Are we all clear on the motion that is before the body? Senator Koenig, uh, uh, Kupik. Could I have a roll call on that, Mr. Roll President? Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and I will speak to that, but then after I speak to that, I would like to do my point of parliamentary inquiry where we left off. I will speak in favor of the motion because the, the amendment to the A18 amendment, as it's drafted, it, re, it rolls back the amendment to the amendment, the A18, that we had previously adopted into the bill. So in other words, Mr. President, this body and a majority already adopted language that, it, that protects students from harmful content. The Kunesh Amendment, the A54 Amendment to the Amendment, rolls that back and puts us back to as if the amendment had never been offered to begin with. So the motion to reconsider is something we would want to vote green for, because a motion to reconsider will allow us to retain the original language and protect children from access to harmful material, whereas a red vote would not allow protections of children against harmful content. And with that, Mr. President, I, would I have my point of parliamentary inquiry under Mason's fo section 408. So uh, do you want to do that now, or do you want to wait until after we uh, deal with the issue that is before the body, which is a motion to reconsider? We'll do it right now, Mr. President. Thank you. A state your uh, parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. President. And for I, I want to make sure that I'm crystal clear in your understanding as we move forward with future amendments and amendments to the amendment. I so hence the point of my parliamentary inquiry is to understand the action that has taken place. I want to make sure that I, and that's the parliamentary inquiry. So as I read the A54 amendment, it reads as follows. So will you please cite the rule that you're coming from? You 408, it's Mason section 408. Four, 408, we, we are talking about the same provision and yes. area that we, we just been given advice on. Go ahead. Correct, thank you, Mr. President. So the Kunesh A54 amendment reads, moves to amend the A18 amendment. So it want, this amendment before me wants to amend the A18. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that I understand for, for the future going forward. So if there's an amendment, in this case the A17, and then there's an amendment to the amendment, the A18. Mm -hmm. If an amendment to the amendment is adopted and therefore incorporated into the underlying amendment, mm -hmm. instead of continuing to offer amendments to the underlying amendment, we could offer at that point an amendment to the amendment to the amendment as it's written because it'll be considered an amendment to an amendment. I just want to make sure uh, that's how I'm understanding your ruling, hence the point of my parliamentary inquiry to understand the future drafting of amendments. As I mentioned to you, and I'm not going to mention it again because I want us to go forward, right? Is, is I've already given a detailed analysis, a lot more than what I'd like to give from this particular space. One is, but because you keep asking the same question again, I'll go through it again. Once the A17 and the A18 were adopted and folded into the bill, it was no longer an amendment to the amendment at that particular time, so that even though the A54 was written to the A18, it was not considered a third amendment to the amendment removed, which would be inappropriate. So because there's not live engrossment, and it's my understanding that that is the process and that's the way that the uh, uh, front, front desk does it. So that's what happened. And going forward, I would even like to make sure that even on the board, if we have something like that, that we don't cause any more confusion because it does cause, cause confusion when you see amendment to the amendment even though uh, 
uh, we had already dealt with the underlining A17 and the A18. Thank you, Mr. President. And to the motion before us, my final remarks are, again, Mr. President and members, vote green on this motion to reconsider so that we can have a vote on the Kunesh again that seeks to not extend the protections to children. So again, vote green in the immediately forthcoming vote. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, it's not uncommon for members to vote and realize that their vote isn't exactly how they misunderstood or uh, they pressed the wrong button. Certainly, there's been a lot of confusion around this particular amendment. And the minority has supported majority members who have voted in the wrong way and asked to be reconsidered to change their vote. I'm asking members of the majority to provide the minority the same courtesy and respect that we've helped provide you in the past. And please vote green on the Farnsworth motion to reconsider. And members, you are, uh, do you need me to read again that we're on the motion to reconsider so everyone's okay? Everyone's good? Motion to reconsider is that uh, Senator Farnsworth, um, uh, having voted on the prevailing side, moved that the vote whereby the A54 amendment to House File 2497 was adopted on April 24th, 2023, be now reconsidered. And a roll call was requested and a roll call was granted. With that, the secretary will take the roll on the motion to reconsider. Senator Broden, are we ready? <laughs> Senator Broden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. Senator Zizinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. All senators having voted who desires a vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 43 ayes and 24 noes, the um, motion to reconsider prevails. <laughs> Members, just so that we're all on the same page, we are now on the A54 uh, amendment, and it moves uh, adoption. Uh, well, the A54, uh, excuse me, the A18 amendment to House File Number 2047, adopted by the Senate on April 24th, 2023. Senator Kunis, to your uh, amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this amendment deletes everything. Um, uh, on page one, line eight, it deletes everything after restrict and insert student access to materials as required under section 125B.115, and then it deletes lines nine through 14. Senator, uh, uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I would ask for a roll call. Roll call requested and roll call granted. Thank you, Mr. President, and I would encourage members to vote no on the Kunesh A54 amendment to the A18 amendment. We all voted in favor 
of my original underlying or my original A18 amendment and then the subsequent A17 underlying amendment as adopt as amended so we can protect children. We know that harm to children is not exclusively to the internet. And we want to make sure to protect our children against harm. In order to do that, we need to vote down this Senator Kunesh attempt to roll back the previously adopted language to protect children. So again, vote red on this immediate vote before us. Thank you. S Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And, and even though I disagree that this procedure is uh, correct, I would, I would agree with Senator Lucero that we should be voting red on this. Um, This goes exactly opposite of what the majority of the members just voted for. And I believe under 408 that's exactly of Masons, that's exactly what we're supposed to prevent is having things come up and change what was just voted. So that's why I believe this is the wrong procedure. Uh, this is improper to be before us. But with that said, um, if you voted for the A18 amendment uh, to the amendment, then you need to vote red on what's before us right now. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, uh, Senator, I thought it was Senator Rasmussen. They told me that was you. Senator Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Kunis yield for a question? Senator Kunis, will you yield? She will yield for a question. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kunis, uh, if the A54 amendment or amendment to the amendment, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but if the A54 is adopted, what would the outcome be? Senator Kunish, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, it would um, go to the A18 and delete everything after, let me look here, after the word restrict and insert student access to materials as required under Section 125B.15, where we already have protections in for um, for the issues that Senator Lucero is looking at. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Kunish yield for another question? Senator, Senator Kunish, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I read the A54, so I understand what the amendment says, but what is the intent, Senator Kunish, what is the intent of the A54 amendment? Senator Kunish, to the question. The intent is to um, ensure that the current language stays as it is and is consistent uh, with the recognition that we do not need to uh, redo what already is in statute. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Kunish uh, yield for one more question? Senator uh, Kunish, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kunish, if the A54 amendment is adopted, will that change what the majority of this body voted on with the Lucero amendment? Senator Kunis. Mr. President and, and Senator Miller, I can't say that because I, I don't know how everybody chooses to vote on this next vote. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. If Senator Kunish will continue to yield for another question. Senator Kunish, will you yield for another question? She will yield. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Senator Kunish. Perhaps I, I misspoke, but if the A54 is adopted, will that change the outcome of how the majority of the members of this chamber recently voted on the Lucero Amendment? Uh, Senator Kunis, to the question. Uh, Mr. President and Senator Miller, um, I would say probably yes. Senator Miller, any other discussion on the A54? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And just so members are aware of the language, the specific language that Senator Kunish is attempting to delete, I will read it. Student access to material that is reasonably believed to be obscene or child pornography or material harmful to minors under federal or state law. It should not be controversial. Senator Kunesh's attempt to delete this language is a terrible idea 
And because of that, we need to vote red to preserve this good language to protect children. Members, vote red. Any further discussions on the A54? There's been a roll call requested. Senator Kunis, you can have the last word because it's your underlining um, is your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said earlier, um, we already have these protections in law. We don't need to reiterate it in a, in a different way. And so I would encourage everybody to vote green. Seeing, none, seeing no additional discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the A-54. <laughs> Members, please vote. Oh, Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. And Senator Fate votes aye. And Senator Fate votes aye. Uh, Senator, oh, he's not ready yet. Members, please vote. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Western votes no. Senator Western votes no. All, all having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 33 noes, the amendment, the A54 amendment is adopted. Mr. President, parliamentary inquiry. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Parliamentary inquiry under Mason section 398. And I'm sorry to continue this discussion, Mr. President. We are continuing to look at this as we go along. Mr. President, Section 398 states, a substantive amendment to a proposal once adopted may not be amended. That's uh, Section 398.1. Given that the Kunish Amendment, again, was drafted to the A18 Amendment, which was adopted, it seems to me that now under Section 398, and I'm just following your logic and continuing your research, it was out of order for that amendment to be amended once adopted. And so even the vote we just took is out of order. And, so, and I would like, that's my parliamentary inquiry, was a ruling on Section 390, on Section 398. So, Senator Pratt, I wanted to take you to the line that you did not read. The line that you did not read said, this does not prohibit the consideration of further amendments to the proposal as amended. So the A-17 and the A-18 was amended and became, uh, uh, because we don't do live engrossments, so this rule, uh, so this section 398 says, this does not prohibit the consideration of further amendments to the proposal as amended. So I believe that answers your, your question, and if we have any further discussion, I'll be happy to talk with you all offline. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. And just a, a quick additional par parliamentary inquiry on that, on that particular item. So when we say a substantive amendment to a proposal, I'm assuming the proposal is the underlying bill. And therefore, when it does, it does not prohibit consideration to further amendments to the proposal as amended, I'm assuming it's to the underlying bill, not to the amendment in, in the first part of that uh, paragraph. And, and so again, Mr. President, I would say that the, the amendment may not be changed according to the first part of, of 398.1, but that does not preclude additional amendments to that same section. They just need to be separate amendments, not to the amendment that was adopted. So um, uh, here's the last thing that I'll say about it because I like for uh, people to ask questions, but I don't want to get into a, an extended long-term debate, just so that we're clear. 
The same rule that you cited, if you've gone to the next line, the sentence, says this does not prohibit the consideration of further amendments to the proposal as amended. Just so that we're also clear that once an amendment is adopted, it, it becomes a part of the bill. And because we don't do live engrossments, and usually what a live engrossment is, you know what an, an engrossment is, that once it goes through, the, the, the uh, reviser and others make, make the net necessary changes so it becomes a part of the bill. So when you get the engrossed copy, you see those things. So you don't get the benefit of seeing a live engrossment. So what individuals have the opportunity to do is to revisit an amendment uh, 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 consistent with Section 398. So with that being said, any further um, uh, um, amendments? Uh, uh, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, a point of parliamentary inquiry, please, Section 408. Members, we can do this all night because I enjoy it. But we have been to 408 many times tonight. 408, uh, 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 Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. We, we don't want to go over this any more than you do, but we do need to know to be clear, like you say, we want to, you want to be clear, we want to be clear going forward. So section 408 says that only one amendment to the proposal um, is permitted at a time and one amendment to that amendment for an amendment of a second degree. But nowhere in there does it say whether the bill has been engrossed or not engrossed. It says an amendment to the third degree would be too complicated and not in order. So going forward, are you reading that as we can have an amendment to the amendment to the amendment? Just so we know, going forward, we can have however many amendments we want. We can do it like this because the bill hasn't been engrossed. So, Senator Howley, I think you asked a, a very good question, and just so that we are in, in intellectually on the same level, okay? An amendment that, so I want to use what, what, what has been a part of what we've been discussing. So the A-17 and the A-18 was the amendment to the amendment. The body adopted the A-17, excuse me, the A-18, and it went on the A-17, and that uh, became the A-17 as amended, and then the body took that. Once that happened, that goes into the body of the bill. It is no longer an amendment only. It is in the body of the bill because we don't do live engrossment. I don't know how many times I need to say that. We don't do live engrossments. That's the only thing we have. And the only thing a person can do if they want to respond to that amendment is to, to, uh, to draft something uh, accordingly. Uh, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. I understand that's how you see it, and that could make sense on, on some level, but it has never been done that way in my 11 years here. Has there been an amendment to the amendment adopted, it's not engrossed live, so we don't see it, and then an amendment to the amendment is, an amendment to the amendment to the amendment is then offered and then passed. So I'm just saying, I've never seen it done in 11 years, and it was done here tonight, so is that how we're going to go forward. This is how you interpret it. So, uh, Senator Housley, I think it's the way you're describing it, where you intentionally, it sounds like, trying to make it something other than what it is. And after conferring with staff, from my understanding, it has been done before, and this is not the first time that it's been done that way because of the fact that we don't do live engrossments. That's the information that's been received from all the front staff, and, and that's consistent. So thank you so very much. We will now go to any additional amendments. Uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, all right, we'll get back um, to some of the other discussion at hand. The, the bill in front of us, I, I guess I'll start, start over a little. Education finance is an incredibly complicated subject that's in front of us right now. And there are a lot of things that this bill is trying to address. But I think one of the things that we have talked about and we've heard from so many people in the public that our students are behind in reading, in math, and in science. 
and they want some simple proposals in front of them, funding that's going to be in front of them to help our kids get caught up. And I think there are a number of things in this bill that are getting off track from that. And there are a lot of things in the bill that are looking to supplement. And so, Mr. President, in that discussion, I would like to offer the A-52 amendment. Senator Rarick offers the A-52 amendment, and the Secretary will report the A-52. Senator Rarick moves to amend House File Number 2497, as amended pursuant to Rule 45, as follows. Page 16, line 25, delete 8,478,142,000. 8, this is the A-52 amendment. Senator Rarick, to your A-52 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, in this bill, we're seeing a lot of funds going to a lot of different places. And one of the things we heard about from a, a number of uh, groups that came to the committee is they provide services to help kids get caught up in, in certain areas and assistance for schools. Um, one of the things that has been talked a lot about and that this amendment gets to is one more option for giving students assistance, and that is what is called education savings accounts, which would be directed to the families to be able to make choices on how to get assistance. And I know there are a lot of different um, discussions around how an education savings account would be handled, and, and we haven't had a chance to have a lot of those discussions in committee, but I think it's a discussion that it, you know, we hear from schools a lot that the funding, they want the funding coming to schools and they don't like um, these savings account options, but yet we're already giving a lot of money out to nonprofits and to other entities in this bill um, rather than to schools. And so I hope we are open to having discussions in the future about all of these options that could help families the assistance for their kids to get caught up, because we've all heard how far behind students are. But I know we haven't had uh, time for discussing these proposals and for which one is best, but I did want to make sure we had a little bit of discussion. So I would withdraw the A52 amendment, but offer the A1 amendment. So just so that I'm clear, did you withdraw the A52 amendment? Yes. And now Senator Rick offers the A51. One A1. amendment. The A1. secretary will report the A51. Just the A1. 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 I'm sorry. Let's correct the record. The A1. The secretary will report it. Senator Rarick moves to amend House File Number 2497 as amended pursuant to Rule 45 as follows. Page 16 after line 17. Insert. This is the A1 amendment. Senator Rarick, to your A1. Thank you, Mr. President. And there's been a lot of. Uh, Again, a lot of discussion in the education realm this year on things that we can be doing to help students get caught up, but we also have a lot of uh, requirements that are being put on our schools, not just in this bill, but in a number of other bills that are coming forward. And we've heard a lot of conversation from our school boards, from our superintendents, uh, from teachers on what all of these mandates and requirements would do and so the A1 amendment would be asking that the commissioner of education would give a report to the chair and the ranking members of the committees of jurisdiction so we could get an understanding of and be able to keep track of what all of these new requirements and mandates have had on our school districts and, and what the repercussions have been um, and with that, Mr. President, I would like to offer the A5 amendment to the amendment. Senator Rarick offers the A5 amendment to the amendment. And the secretary will report the A5 amendment to the amendment. Senator Rarick moves to amend the A1 amendment to House File Number 2497 as follows. Page 1 after line 9, insert. This is the A5 amendment to the amendment. Senator Rarick, to your A5 Amendment to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, 
The mandates that uh, we are looking at um, putting, adding to the schools this year, uh, we've heard repeatedly from superintendents, you know, the underlying bill is, is providing a lot of new revenue for our schools, but the mandates that are coming forward in this bill and in other bills would actually bring our schools into deficits. And we've heard repeatedly from school boards, from superintendents, to please not do this. They're at a time coming out of the pandemic, our students are behind, they are struggling to get our kids caught up in math and reading and science. And new requirements and new mandates would not only put them financially behind, but it is gonna eat up their time putting in new curriculum, putting in new policies, adopting all of this that will actually take away their focus from getting our kids caught up. So what the A5 amendment would say is that it, any of the mandates that we are putting forward in this bill or any others that come without direct appropriation from the state, the school district could consider as an option. They would not be forced to do it, but they could do it as a recommendation. But when the funding actually comes from the state, then it would be a mandate that could be required. Simply put, uh, this would keep their general fund dollars free to do the things they need and not to be eaten up by new requirements. That's the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kupik. Thank you, Mr. President. I would request a roll call on the A5 and the underlying A1. Senator Kupik, uh, 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 roll call requested, roll call granted on both the A5, which is the amendment to the amendment, and the underlying A1 amendment. Uh, any further discussions? Senator uh, Kunish. Oh. Senator Kunish, do you need a little more time? I can go to a couple other people. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it, and I just wanted to stand up and uh, share some things to drive Senator Rarick's point home regarding the amendment to the amendment. Uh, the amendment to the amendment really would be something that ensures we fully fund our schools into the future. I know it's been a topic of discussion for many years and uh, with many bills and many sessions, this idea that we should fully fund our schools. But unfortunately, what happens is oftentimes we pass laws, we pass bills, we mandate things that we don't fully fund. The special education cross subsidy is an example of that. What Senator Rarick's amendment would seek to do is say, hey, if the city of Minnesota is going to mandate school districts do something or have to spend money on something, that either A, the state of Minnesota is going to give them the funding to actually do that, or B, we're going to hold them harmless if the state doesn't provide them the funding to do so. And here's why that's important, Mr. President. Like I'm sure many of you have done, uh, I reached out to school board members and superintendents in my district. Actually, quite frankly, some of them I didn't even have to reach out to. They reached out to me because they were so distressed by some of the bills that are being considered this session, how it's going to impact their budgets. And let me remind you, our school board members are nonpartisan. Our superintendents aren't elected. They just have one goal, to serve kids to serve the districts, the teachers, the parents, the community. They have no political motivation when they give us their feedback regarding these bills, so I want to share some of that feedback with you. This came from a superintendent. I'm reaching out specifically to the provision that would extend unemployment compensation to school district hourly workers. This has now been wrapped into both a House and Senate omnibus education bills without funding. This would end up costing our district approximately $1.6 million per year, essentially eating up a significant portion of the general formula percentage increase the Senate bill would put on the formula. In addition to the cost, it would make it even more difficult to fill our summer hourly positions as many of our school year hourly employees fill these positions in addition to their school year positions. Lastly, the superintendent shared, our school district does not have the funds to cover another unfunded mandate. Even with the potential of new revenue, our district is still covering other unfunded mandates out of our general fund. We hear about K-12 funding stability. Adding another unfunded mandate will only add to the instability we are seeing across the state. This is not from a Republican. This is not from an elected official. 
This is from somebody who is hired to lead and run a school district. And they're telling us, they're, pra they're practically begging and pleading with us not to pass this bill because it's going to lead to so much financial distress for their district. Here's another letter from the executive director of business services in another school district regarding the same provision. He states the following liability would be generated. The general fund, 1.4 million. Student nutrition, 435,000. Community education, 165,000. He goes on to explain, student nutrition and community education do not have the capacity to generate the increased costs. These two fund balances would go negative, they would go negative immediately. Listen to this, members. As for the general fund, we would have to cut more staff members to accommodate these costs. This would be a loss of at least 18 teaching staff. This bill alone would result in this district having to cut at least 18 teaching staff. And he goes on to say this very plainly. The district's point of view would be to not pass this legislation. Folks, this is just one school district of many telling us, do not pass this bill, please. Don't do this to our districts. I don't know how more plainly they could say this. And here's what I'll tell you being a former school board member. Honestly, superintendents uh, and school board members try to walk a fine line. They try to stay as neutral as possible as it pertains to the bills we're considering in the legislature. So for them to come out and so very clearly and concisely explain to us this bill is harmful should not be lost on us. Another superintendent went on to say this when pro uh, providing a legislative update to a school board. He stated, what I'm showing you today are statewide averages of what these unfunded mandates will cost our school systems and drive many of them, most of them, probably all of them, into statutory operating debt or bankruptcy. In his case, it equals it equal a shortfall in his district of $8.5 million annually. He went on to say we need to reach out to our legislators and stop this before we drive ourselves off a fiscal cliff. And he closed by saying this. A lot of folks had high hopes that with a united government in place, we'd get some things done at the legislature this year. Unfortunately, I think this is one of the potentially most damaging sessions I've seen since I've been a superintendent, and that's been for quite a while. Folks, if that doesn't catch our attention, I don't know what will. I'm almost done, Mr. President, but I have a few more, uh, some more feedback from school board members to share. Another school board member had this to say. At the request of the Association of Metropolitan School Districts, our district completed an analysis of the net cost of some bills featuring unfunded mandates currently under consideration in the House and Senate. For just calculating these items, our district's estimates, estimates its costs would top an additional $7.8 million in expenses. To put this in perspective, even a 5% increase in the per-pupil funding formula would add just $2.5 million in revenue for the district, adding $5.3 million in cross subsidies to a district already struggling to address a five-plus million dollar special education cross-subsidy would create nothing short of financial chaos. He closed by saying this, instead of more unfunded mandates and micromanaging district operations from St. Paul, I would again plead for the House and Senate to simply pass the bills that would close the special education cross-subsidies for all districts and let us continue to do what's best for our schools students, and staff. Here's the deal, Mr. President. I've got one more, but I'm not going to read it to save us some time. He essentially says the same thing. As a matter of fact, he says this. Uh, I asked you guys earlier in the year to fund these things. You've waited so long to actually do it that we had to lay people off. So we've got districts all across the state that already have budget shortfalls. They're laying off teachers and staff, which means those people aren't there to teach our students. And now, while they're struggling to overcome their deficits, we're going to mandate and legislate them further in the hole. And folks, that's not my opinion. That's our school board members and superintendents telling us that 
plain as day. So if you want to ensure that we truly are fully funding our schools and we prevent ourselves and we prevent these districts from finding themselves in this position again in the future, you will support Senator Rarick's amendment, you'll vote green, and you will not allow us to pass laws and bills that are going to put our districts in financial chaos. Thank you. Senator, Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Mr. President, and I also stand in support of Senator Rarick's amendment. Uh, I have information from the, let's see here, 32 school districts in the Arrowhead region, which is the, uh, of course, the greatest part of the state of Minnesota. Uh, of that 32, actually 11 didn't fill in the information, so I have information for 22. Here's a sampling of what schools are telling us, and again, to, to echo what Senator Duckworth said, um, these are nonpartisan folks, these are superintendents, business managers that are giving us this information. The small school district in Aiken, Minnesota would be underwater with all of these mandates, even with all of the new money, by $567,852. And Mr. President, we had them figure this out um, to include mandates that are in the bills, also to include assumed uh, employee raises, assumed increases in, in insurance rates. And so all of that was factored into this. The small school of Chisholm, where I uh, graduated from high school, uh, as I mentioned earlier today, would be underwater by $1 million $21,410. The school district in Duluth would do a little bit better. They would only be underwater by about $655,000. Hermantown was the biggest uh, loser in the Arrowhead on this list at $2,287,000. My hometown of Hibbing was $1,561,000. Uh, the small town of International Falls was a little bit over $1.1 million. And then the Rock Ridge School District, which is the cities of Virginia, Eveleth, and Gilbert would be $1.9 million. So for the 22 schools that got the information back to us, they would be $20,366,000 in just one year, in just the first year after these mandates take effect. We would be doing more harm than good, Mr. President, if we allow these mandates to take place without proper funding. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I rise in support of uh, Senator Rarick's amendment. You know, having been on the school board, one of the big aggravations that administration and school board members suffer with is unfunded mandates, and this bill is full of them. I talked about six or seven superintendents uh, in the last uh, week or so, uh, most of them in my district. But uh, this particular letter from this particular superintendent kind of sums it up best when he looked at all the things coming down. And again, these are the superintendents, the head administrator of the public schools. But what he says is, well, in his case, it's a smaller school district. He said the cost of these mandates is between, uh, in the next two years, between 3.2 and 3.6 million uh, in the biennium. And then they get 1.37 and 1.47. So they're going to be about $2 million short. But this is the conclusion that he comes with. And I think this is what all members need to realize uh, in terms of these unfunded mandates. What, and these are his words. What is so frustrating is that the legislative proposals are being touted as one of the most significant investments in education in state history. I'm sure we'll hear that. If all of these proposals are implemented, our public will not understand why we fall into financial distress. School, school districts will either need to make massive reductions and or ask local residents to approve an increase in their property taxes. Once again, school districts will be targeted for public frustration and anger and likely will be blamed for not being able to be responsible to manage their finances. So members, it's not just sending the unfunded mandates and leaving them in deficit and saying, well, go to the public. The public is going to read the paper and hear the, the quotes. This is one of the uh, 
most uh, significant investments in public history and state history. And then they're going to have these same public schools turn around and either make massive cuts or say you have to give, pass more property taxes. At the same time, the state of Minnesota is only going to send them $275 per person back uh, on the current tax proposal. And then we want to raise taxes and fees another $10 billion if that goes through. So this is insanity, economic insanity, members and Mr. President. So you're not helping, and then when you, on top of that, if you pass a, a requirement that they have to, that the school district has to uh, negotiate class sizes and a host of other things, well, we know what that's going to do. You're going to reduce class sizes at the same time you're cutting, the same time you're driving the, the uh, districts into, into uh, deficit, SOD, which I, when I was on the school board, we had that with declining enrollment. And I know how that, how that works. It's very depressing, and the, the public's irritated, and uh, the school district's irritated, and it just causes a tremendous amount of frustration. And you're doing this, if you pass this bill with all these unfunded mandates, you're doing this across the state to school districts. Not just the one I was in, but, but they'll all be suffering from this. And members, think about this. That's why Senator Rarick's amendment is so important, to lift the burden from these school districts and give them some flexibility in terms of how to apply the funding in a way that maximizes the benefits for students and also properly compensates uh, certified staff and the other staff there. This is a completely wrong direction. It's gonna cause more problems, less academic success, and more frustration by the public. So please, members, vote green on Senator Rarick's uh, amendment. Thank Senator you, Mr. May President, members. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, it's so funny when you uh, sit on a committee and you go through and you do the largest infusion of support to our public schools, and then to hear uh, this hysteria, it, it, it's, it's like surreal. Um, and so I was able to get a copy of the list that folks are reading from for these unfunded mandates. Um, only one of the seven here on this list are actually in this bill. Um, everything else that everybody's talking about are paying teachers when they have babies for a paid time off, not in this bill. Paid sick leave so they don't go broke when they get strep throat or their kid breaks their leg, also not in this bill. Pensions, not in this bill. Uh, salary requirements, not in this bill. Prep time, not in this bill. Health insurance, not in this bill. Mr. President, there is a lot, a lot of incredible stuff in this bill. And Senator Kunish spent a lot of time at the beginning of this bill kind of walking through it. But one of the great things about having a teacher as the chair of the Education Finance Committee, she funded every single piece I have the privilege and honor of being the chief author of the READ Act to make sure that every student in Minnesota is taught how to read and that their teachers are taught how to teach them how to read. $70 million for curriculum, for teacher prep, continuing education. We're closing the special ed cross subsidy, the ELL cross subsidy. There's support for teachers. There's support for our students. There's support for transportation. There's support for media library specialists to put trained media specialists into our schools. There's support for menstrual equity. There's support for orientation, prepare professionals, after school learning, full service community schools. We already passed universal school meals. We've got native language revitalization, teacher mentoring program. I mean, this is a really wonderful bill. Every single thing I just named is funded. And so while my colleagues, uh, Mr. Mr. President, are clearly reading from some old document that is not relevant to this bill, I am so, so glad that I get to stand up and calm everybody down and bring us back to reality, where we're all living with this bill, which is the largest infusion of support into our public schools in Minnesota state history. And every single provision in this bill is funded. And so 
I understand it's really, really hard to find something to hate about a bill that supports schools this much. I get that. And that's kind of like the back and forth in the chamber, Mr. President. We got to do that, I know. But this bill funds every single provision that we put into it. That's why it's a budget bill and not a policy bill. And so, um, members, I'm going to ask you to vote no on this amendment. I'm really, really grateful to Senator Kunish for her leadership because an educator put this bill together and it shows. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Uh, Mr. President, I rise in favor of this amendment. I will save my comments uh, till a later time. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think, I think the terminology that we've been hearing about mandates is interesting because what has been causing the underfunding in schools is the last decade of underfunding. It is not this bill. This bill is an infusion of 2.2 billion additional dollars. If we didn't want our schools to be underfunded right now, we should have passed the education finance omnibus last year, which didn't happen. So we're finally taking a lot of corrections here. But even the school boards, if the job might not be partisan, some of them are. And we know that because we have people here in this room who keep telling us, I was on the school board and we know they're partisan. And we've seen it in different parts of the country where school boards are some of the ones banning books, for example. So as a legislator, legislature that is about to infuse another $2.2 billion, we should have some say in how that money is spent. Because what some of these school boards and administrations are saying is, just give us all the money and we promise we will do good things with us. Well, what's going to happen is one school board might say, hey, we kind of would like to ban books, so this library funding that we have designated, if it, they were left to their own device, the libraries wouldn't get the money. Another might say, mm, we're not really in favor of English language learners, so we're not gonna fund that. Another might say, eh, do we really need more social workers? And that wouldn't get funded. I fully support the fact that we have designated where some of this money goes to make sure that across the state of Minnesota, some of the things like social workers, counselors, mental health, English as a sec second language help, help for a student with disabilities, is funded across the state instead of not uni being uniformly applied. And if someone wants to say that's a mandate, they can knock themselves out. But that is our discretion as a legislature that is infusing $2.2 billion to have a little bit of say what that money is going to be used for. So I think this is completely appropriate that we have done some of those designations. And I think some of these things that we are doing are amazing, like adding to mental health services. And so I stand in support of the underlying bill, not the amendment. Senator Jaszewski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I know it's getting late, and I don't want to reiterate everyone's what they've said, but uh, Senator Duckworth and, and uh, Senator Grunhagen and Senator Rarick uh, have all said things that I'm hearing from my district. I'm not reading it off any list. I talked to them on the phone. And it's surprising how different it can be talked what's going on here. And again, you can all tell that it's record funding and record funding, but my superintendents, my teachers, my school boards are saying the mandates are going to wipe out all that money. It's going to wipe it out. And you know what? I trust them. I've been listening to them for seven years. I trust my people. I trust my people in my district. Vote for Senator Rarick's amendment. This is what we're hearing from our school districts. These mandates are going to wipe out the dollars that you're putting in to the education bill. We're all hearing it. Something cannot be right when one side of the aisle is hearing one thing and we're hearing something else because it's coming from our superintendents, our school boards, all nonpartisan people. 
We need to support Senator Rarick's amendment. Please vote green. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I too want to rise in support of this amendment. Uh, I realize that this bill only includes probably one or two mandates, but the reality is to the school districts, it's the total number of mandates that get passed in this legislative body that are unfunded that affects the schools that's going to count. I've talked to several districts. And the things we've heard so far tonight are the same things I'm hearing in my districts. One of the school districts, after they take into account the proposed per pupil funding increase, take into account some of the mandates, they're going to end up a half a million dollars short. Another school district, they're going to end up $700,000 short. Mind, remind you, these are small rural school districts. Another school district, estimates that the per-pupil funding formula would need to increase to 29.1% or $1,987 per student for them to break even when they took a, take a look at the proposed mandates and the proposed dollars that they're going to receive in per-pupil payments. Now, we can talk about if these, are, these folks are politically correct, if these folks are politically minded or whatever they might be, uh, whether the partisan is partisan or not, the numbers don't lie, the numbers are the facts. We also talk about there's only a couple of mandates in this bill, and so don't worry about the rest. Well, I do worry about the rest because, like I said earlier, if this bill is passed and some of these other bills are passed, that's the position our schools are going to be in. And you know, I've been in this business now for 13 years, and I've never heard such an outcry from the school districts as I have this year. So we can talk about, you know, we, we always like to shift the blame, point fingers, so we can talk about what did or did not happen in the past, but folks, let's be realistic. It's what's happening now that counts. Yes, you're putting $2.2 billion of money into education, but a lot of those dollars are not going that's going to directly help the students. And we do have to take a look at what's going to affect our school districts. And so therefore, I would ask that we have a green vote on this amendment. Senator Kunis, and then after soon, Senator Kunis, just so I'm clear, I was going to the author after Sen Senator Kunis. Then I think Senator Duckworth wants to say something. So Senator Kunis, Senator Duckworth. Anyone else? Senator Hostile. Anyone else? So no one can say that we didn't move slow enough. Senator Kunis. I guess I wore that out. Um, so members, um, recognizing for years and years and years, uh, every fall we would come back to school and we would hear uh, that, you know, in our first uh, staff meeting, all the mandates coming down from the legislature. And we would hear all about those unfunded mandates. Sometimes they were funded. Sometimes they were not, and sometimes they're just the cost of doing business. This year, our target is $2.5 billion. That's the joint target that we have to work with. It's the largest amount we've ever had. And so when we built this bill, we were extremely intentional about making sure that everything that we put in that bill is funded. Is everything line itemed? Maybe not. But when we asked for a report, that's part of doing the business of the, of the, of the school. 
I can't imagine that we have to direct every single thing. If it's one thing that we really do hear from the schools is that they want to, um, they, they want to be unfeathered. They want to be able to have local control. And so within this bill, those things allow not only the, uh, the local control, but we funded everything in this bill. And it's interesting to think about um, our, our GOP members uh, bringing this up and the lack of dollars that our school districts have to, to deal with. Like I said, our target this year is $2.5 billion. Last year, and so we're feeling the angst, we're feeling the lack of investment over the last couple of years. Last year in this body, we had a target of over $1 billion. It was about $1.2, $1.5 billion. And you know what we left with at the, end of the, at the end of this session, the omnibus bill? A $3 million um, appropriation for a reading a literacy program to a private company. There was no money for higher ed, or excuse me, for um, special ed. There was no money for our English learners. There was no money for our teachers or to reduce class sizes. There was nothing allocated for all of those items that you find here in this, in this bill. And if we jump back two years, you know what the offer was from this body? that was not a uh, um, DFL majority, they started out at zero and zero. Members, my budget bill here is offering four and five. And the, every item in there is appropriated and appropriated appropriately. And so members, when we talk about unfunded mandates, uh, it just isn't true. It's not in this bill. One of the things that I'm wondering about, too, um, Senator Rarick, and I, I, I'm going to bring this up, but I don't need to ask you um, to stand up and respond unless you want to later on. But we have to remember that our SPED program is an unfunded mandate at the federal level. So under this bill, I'm assuming that we that schools would not have to fund um, uh, our SPED programs. So when we talk about um, unseen consequences, I think that this is one of those examples that um, not only are un is unnecessary, it's unrealistic, and um, certainly not worth a red, uh, a not worth a green vote, and so members, I would ask you to vote uh, red on this amendment. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, I appreciate it. And uh, what was just shared is the exact illustration of what's wrong with this bill and what has transpired as a part of this debate. Uh, as it pertains to the bill, as it pertains to mandates, as it pertains to the funding proposed, we're only hearing half the story, just like we only heard half the story of what happened last session. And Mr. President, I'm not one of those people that finds it useful to relitigate the past. I wasn't going to go there, but I certainly see value in correcting the record. It was stated that two years ago, the Republicans in the state Senate didn't offer an increase to funding to our public schools at all, when in reality, what passed that session was a bipartisan effort to provide the largest increase in funding to our public schools in I think it was 10 or 15 years. In addition to that, just last year, on the Senate, on the, uh, Senate and House Education Conference Committee, Republican members all voted to take $950 million and give it directly to our public schools to go toward the special education cross subsidy, and another $50 million we voted for to go to those schools to help with their literacy needs. 
So if we're going to debate these bills and have these conversations, at least do the courtesy to the people of Minnesota by being honest and telling the complete whole story. Just like how we should be telling the complete whole story regarding this bill and its increase in funding, but also its substantial increase in required expenditures. That's an important aspect of this bill we can't simply disregard, ignore, or not talk about. And that's why we're hearing school boards and superintendents reach out in what was mockingly referred to as hysteria. Are you kidding? We're getting valuable feedback from these folks who are pleading and asking for us to be cognizant of what we're doing, and we're going to say it's hysteria? You know, early in my military career, I remember very plainly an exercise that we were doing. I was in charge. It was my turn to lead the squad or the platoon through some sort of scenario. And I was focused on getting the job done. I was focused on the mission, and that's what we were going to do. And at least a handful of times while we were trying to execute that mission, other soldiers that were a part of my team came up to me and said, Zach, I think you should think about this, or you should reconsider this, or have you thought about this? At the end of the day, I decided to just plow forward and get it done. And the lesson I learned was, when you've got so many other people telling you out of good faith and out of genuine concern that you might want to rethink what you're doing, there's a good reason they're asking you to do that. There's a good reason that we as a legislature are hearing from superintendents, from school board members, and other organizations that are saying, pause before you enact this. It's going to have second and third order effects and consequences that we need you to be aware of, and you're going to be doing us and our students a huge disservice if you simply force it through. Mr. President, I'm, I'm kind of shocked and disappointed at the uh, flippant, the flippant disregard that was shown toward the feedback and concerns that were shared from superintendents and school board members all across the state. Um, I don't think that's fitting of the legislature at all. And then to take it a step further and uh, almost go so far as to say that our, uh, we don't trust our school boards to manage the resources that we somehow have some sort of adversarial relationship with them, that's not good. That doesn't build trust between us and those local representatives who are here to serve their community. That's not the, the, the kind of tone or dialogue we should be having at all when we're talking about this bill. And last but not least, Mr. President, if all these things are funded, as has been claimed by my colleagues across the aisle, if we don't have to worry about this issue because everything's funded, well then, a green vote for Senator Rarick's amendment should be pretty easy, because that's all his bill says that if we're going to require these schools to do these things, they're going to be fully funded. So if I take my colleagues at the word that they're fully funding all these mandates, let's just go ahead and make sure of that and vote green on this amendment. Thank you. Senator Hostow. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I take seriously the concerns of my superintendents and my school board members all across the Northland. In fact, I talked to two of them on my drive down here from Hermantown this morning. Um, I want to address something that my colleague and good friend on the Iron Range, Senator Farnsworth, brought up, which is some information that we got from superintendents in our region regarding costs of unfunded mandates. Just as an example, the Hermantown School District lists unfunded mandates at approximately $12.5 million, let's just say. Of that $12.5 million, they associate $10.5 million as building costs for increasing classrooms because of classroom ratios that do not exist in this bill. There are no ratios mandated in this bill or in any bills in the Senate, and I would speculate that in the House maybe there was a proposal, but I have not seen that. In addition to that, they uh, associate $1.5 million on class-side reduction staff for those very ratios. The ratios that they're estimating, 17 students per class. So of the, again, 12.5 million in unfunded mandates, almost 11 and a half, no, excuse me, almost 12 million are things that are quite literally not in this bill and not in any bills being considered in the state Senate. So I just want to be abundantly clear that the information before us is real and transparent and that what we are all basing this off of is in reality. 
and I think that's really, really important. And I'm talking to superintendents in my region on a daily basis about these very things and explaining what's in this bill. And I think that's just really important that we, that we uh, come back to reality on what we're talking about here. Thank you. The last voice that we hear is from the author of the um, amendments, uh, Senator Rarick, and then we will vote. Thank you, Mr. President. A couple things that I will address. Uh, first, in regards to the special education cross-subsidy that Senator Kunish asked about. Uh, the amendment before us would only be applicable to new mandates and state mandates. Special education is a federal mandate, so this, and it's already existing, so that would not be covered under this amendment. What I want to also mention is that Senators uh, Mayquade and Hochschild proved one of my points for my opening statement. Unfortunately, we cannot address all of the mandates and requirements that schools are facing in this legislature because they do not all exist in this bill. I admit that. But they are looking at the education finance bill, the education policy bill, the labor bill. They're looking at bills that are coming through standalone. They are looking at things that were in the governor's proposal. They're looking at things that are in the House proposal. And they are very, very worried about all of those things being incorporated. And at this point, they have to consider those. And so what this amendment is getting at, I'm not calling out anything in particular because I can only deal with what is in this bill, but we're saying if money is not appropriated directly for some of these new requirements, whether it's around curriculum or whether it's around ratios, and they are those proposals are out there in legislation and in the legislatures, maybe not this particular bill, but they're there. And those school districts have to think about it, they have to consider that, and so this is getting directly at that and helping alleviate their fears. I get it, We're, this is an incredible target that was given to education finance. I'm not denying that. But as our school districts are looking at it, and here's one of the other issues we have. When these, most people, when they look at what's happening around education, they're looking at the education policy and they're looking at the education finance bill. And they don't think about all of the other pieces of legislation that might have impacts on them. So we can look at this bill standalone in a vacuum and say, Wow, this is some incredible funding going to our schools. But we know our superintendents and our school boards, they have folks that help them dig through all the proposals that are here at the Capitol. The Minnesota School Board Association, just in the two education bills, count 49 mandates. That's not my count, that's the school board associations. Some of them might have an incredibly small price tag, but it all adds up, Mr. President. And we have heard from virtually every district across the state that although there is a lot of new funding coming to our schools, when they look at all the proposals that are out there that could add new expenses, they honestly believe they will be operating in a larger deficit than they already are. This amendment looks to alleviate that fear. It helps them understand there might be things we're suggesting or recommending for them to do, but if they do not receive the funding to specifically do that, we will not require them to take those actions and put their districts in bankruptcy. Thank you, Mr. President. The Secretary will take the role on the amendment to the amendment. Members, just so everyone's on the same page, What's before the body is the A5 amendment to the amendment. Please vote. <laughs> Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. 
Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes aye. Senator Western votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Members, just as a friendly reminder, we are now on the A1 Amendment and there was a roll call requested is my understanding. Uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, since that one was not adopted, I would like to offer the A-10 amendment to the Senator amendment. Rarick offers the A-10 amendment. The Secretary will report the A-10 amendment. Senator Rarick moves to amend the A-1 amendment to House File Number 2497 as follows. Page 1 after line 3, insert. This is the A-10 amendment. Senator Rick, to your A-10 amendment. This uh, is an amendment to the amendment. Correct. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, we had a, a lot of discussion here, you know, and again, there are a number of mandates throughout proposals in the legislation. They are not in the bill in front of us. And so we, I cannot address those in particular. But I can address the few that are here and as discussed earlier, we have a number of uh, things that are going, you know, money that's being allocated to some nonprofits, to the agency. But we have been talking to our schools, and when they saw the target given to this committee, they thought they were going to have opportunities to really address the needs that they have, that we have been hearing about for the last couple of years. So this amendment would delete the mandates that are in this bill, and then they would reallocate the money that's in this bill to five simple categories that would have a direct impact on our schools and in the classrooms. So the two biggest pieces of this proposal would be a five and five on the formula and buying down the special education cross subsidy by 65 percent. And what's we've heard and as a new member to education and trying to get up to speed on all the formulas and everything, the one thing I hear over and over from those in our school districts is that these are the two that give our schools the most flexibility to deal with what they need. Some might need some counselors to help with the mental health crisis. Some might need to help make improvements, hire new teachers. They might want to put it to their libraries. These two provisions allow the money to be available in their general fund where they have the most flexibility to deal with the needs that they have. The three other smaller pieces is we would have 300 million in the first biennium and 200 in the tails for safe school aid. Uh, then we would look at uh, Senate file 3001, which is a Senator Duckworth provision for the reading reset. And there would be 100 million in each biennium for that. And then, to offer some property tax relief for people around the state, we would have equalization aid at $270 million in the tails. And so, Mr. President, these numbers, as I worked, I worked with nonpartisan staff and our other staff to make sure that this, bill, this amendment is in order with the budget target. And I think as our school districts would look at this proposal, they would say, this is what they need to address what is in front of them. And each school district, as we know, they're as unique as each student is. 
And they all have various needs. And they have figured out ways to be as creative as possible to offer what they feel their students are in most need of. And this proposal in front of us will give them, them that continued flexibility to do what they need. If we are going to talk about historic investments in our schools, let's do it in a way that gives them that flexibility to do what they need to best serve their districts. I would ask that members support this and I would ask for a roll call on the 8th. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Kunis, to the, uh, to the A-10 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I would um, counsel members to vote red on this, this uh, amendment. Once again, this is a huge encumbrance that I've not seen, I don't understand. Um, I, I'm, uh, you know, very saddened by the fact that it removes all of the uh, innovative grants that we have in our omnibus bill right now. It takes a lot more than um, reading programs and some of the things that are listed there to educate a well-rounded student. And academics is, is the name of the game in schools, but there also needs to be some things that kids look forward to, like the music programs that we have in our um, in our omnibus. Some of the other things that are going to address the social emotional um, issues. Um, it was interesting, you know, to see as I went through here that all those grants were removed except for Senator Farnsworth. So it was very kind of you to leave that one in there. But members, uh, this is unvetted. It is under investigated. I would certainly not want to agree to any of those uh, tax levies without the permission and the oversight of Senator Rest. And so members, for those reasons, I ask you to vote red on this amendment. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I stand in favor of this amendment. This is what school districts, whether they be the smallest school districts that I represent or the largest are asking for. Yes, we appreciate the historic funding. But the problem is our school districts, and I handed out um, four attachment, uh, four documents for you from different school districts that talked about the problems and the issue is, well, we might say that these mandates are not in this bill before us. The challenge is our school districts have one budget. They have a budget. There's historic funding being added to that budget. But the problem is the cost of the mandates far exceed even the historic uh, increases that are being contemplated here. Now, to that point, yes, many of those large expenses to our schools are not in the bill before us. But the largest one is, and that is the unemployment insurance bill, adding our paras, our our uh, part-time, our hourly employees, who, by the way, as was said in committee, are the glue that hold our schools together. But to add them to unemployment for those three months that school is not in session is going to do two things, according to my school districts. Number one, it will make it much harder for them to offer their much-needed summer school activities, needed now more than ever because of the COVID learning loss. But let's just do the math, members. The math is not going to work. Let me just tell you about on your, on your desks, you have the sheet, the letter from the Rochester Public Schools, one of our largest schools in the state. And the cost of the unemployment insurance alone is $4.88 million. 
And I'll just read the language that they have sent me. As currently worded, this is a 100% new mandate with no funding, no state aid, and no levy authority. So they can't even go to the voters and ask for this money. So we know what's going to happen. That funding has to come out of something else. And for RPS, this has the potential to wipe out all or most of what we have planned to set aside for teachers' salary increases in the next budget year. Adding language to provide state aid or permitting new levy authority if needed for this mandate would help the district manage this change. Neither of those things are in here. And I understand the reluctance to add school levy authority, increasing those levies, because our Minnesotans are struggling still with the high cost of inflation, and we are one of the highest tax states in the nation already, no matter about which indice you look at. So the fact is, the math doesn't add up. And the author of the bill herself in finance committee stated that the cost alone of the unemployment insurance looks to be about 2% of the formula. And we need to ask ourselves, is this what our schools are asking for? No, it is not. And that was one of the largest districts. I also gave you uh, documents from Casson Manorville one of our smallest districts. It's the same with the Byron School District. Our school leaders are very concerned about many of the unfunded mandates. And the one thing in the bill today, right now that we're looking at tonight, is the largest of those unfunded mandates. And it is my hope that we will be able to remove that large unfunded mandate so we could get a very nice bipartisan vote on the bill before us. At the moment, I encourage a step in that direction by supporting the amendment before us. Listen to your school districts. Senator Makeway. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. and. Um, I, you know, I have opinions about the entirety of the amendment, but I'm actually going to speak to one really specific part of the amendment, and it is a whole reason to vote no. And it's the um, inserting of, well, on the amendment, it's 2.19 all the way down to 4. Point something something. Uh, I am so excited, Mr. President, to be the chief author of the READ Act. And let me tell you, being the chief author of the READ Act has required more time and intensive learning that I might have put in since I was in college. I have learned about phonics. I have learned about structured literacy. I've learned what evidence-based is. I've learned about braiding and the child brain. I have learned about the three queuing system. I have learned about phonics. I have learned about curriculum. I've learned about literacy coaches, literacy curriculum directors. I've learned about so many things in order to put this bill together. It has required every single stakeholder, from the school boards to the principals to the educators to the Dyslexia Association to the Department of Education to uh, higher education. I mean, really, truly, this has been a huge undertaking. Every single word from page like 51 to 60 something, I have been over and over and over and over and over. There have been 18 iterations of this to make sure it is perfect. And while I really, really appreciate the attention to literacy in this amendment, it, does, it, it would decimate the very, very, very good work that has been done on, on the READ Act. The READ Act encompasses not only how we teach students how to learn, how we educate their educators, but the money included to do that. So not only, Mr. President, do we provide professional development for all educators in the state, and we phase it in, right? So we start with pre-K through three, and we make sure that they're, uh, you know, people who are dealing with teaching kids how to read, and then we do their principals, and we do counselors too, and then we do the curriculum directors and people at the district, and then we can phase that up. But we also have money in there for districts to buy curriculum so that they are teaching 
evidence-based practices. And not only that, Mr. President, but we go back retroactively in case there are districts who are starting to do good, the good thing like a few years ago and they already purchased the right curriculum, we're going to reimburse them for that too. It was a beautiful process to get to this beautiful part of the bill. That's why it is so many pages. And this would just decimate that. And it would put in and not quite, it's a close, I get, I get the intent behind it, but it's not the right definition. Um, and, and banning certain kinds of curriculum is not going to take care of the problem. And that money won't handle it at all. So members, I'm going to ask you to vote no on this amendment because please don't ruin the READ Act. It is so, so important. And I am so, so grateful it's included in this bill. Thank you. Senator Mitchell, and then we're going to the author of the amendment for the last comments. Oh. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this amendment troubles me because of the things that it guts. And I just want to highlight a couple of those. It, it takes out the English as a um, English learner language, language learner, cross-subsidy, um, orientation for paraprofessionals, a number of other things. But I want to highlight two. One is the specific funding for school nurses, mental health, social workers, counselors, all those things. Uh, last year, I already had a school visit to, to talk with a young women's group um, at a high school that happened to ha take place the day after Uvalde. It was already scheduled. I went. It was hard. And so we were supposed to be talking about, you know, getting more involved in the community around you. But one of the things we ended up talking about was not only our failure to protect our children from gun violence, but mental health. Because our school counselors should be funded at a rate of one counselor for 250 children. And in the schools in my district, that's running at four and 500. And in some parts of Minnesota, it's one counselor per six or 700. And I asked the students, what does that mean for you? And one of them said, if I need to see a counselor, I might have to wait weeks to get in. Can you imagine a student who might be having a mental breakdown or a crisis having to wait weeks to get in to see a counselor? Let's be honest, that could be the difference between a school shooting or not. And we are taking away that funding with this amendment. The other thing that this does is it guts the entire early childhood portion of this funding, about $300 million. And here's why that is important. Some of the things included in there is developmental screening. I'm a foster parent. I work with some children who have developmental delays and other special needs. The earlier that you can catch those things, the better outcome through life for the child. Early learning scholarships, um, helping with early childhood teacher shortages, Head Start, these are the founding blocks. That time from zero to three is the most crucial brain development, and these are the founding blocks, and this amendment takes that away. So I would urge a red vote on this for so many reasons, including all the things that it would take from our children. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I first want to start off by saying that I have uh, tremendous respect for the work that Senator McQuaid has done as it relates to literacy and her uh, iterations of the READ Act. Um, to what was most recently said, the only thing that's being gutted are school district budgets by the mandates in this bill and the other mandates being considered. Things like mental health, funding for early childhood education, nurses, music, social emotional learning, ELL and many other things are funded in Senator Rarick's amendment. The only difference to our approach is we give our districts the funding directly and trust, trust them to best utilize those funds to meet those needs in the way they see fit because we know all districts are different and have different needs. 
The amendment's not hard to understand. It's pretty easy to understand, and I'll, I'll help you understand it by sh telling you what some of the contrasts are. Instead of a 4 and 5% increase to the funding formula, respectively, this amendment offers a 5 and 5% increase to the funding formula. Instead of a 40 to 47% uh, funding of the special education cross-subsidy, the amendment calls for a 65% funding of it. Rather than zero dollars being invested in safe schools aid, this amendment provides $300 million for safe schools aid. Instead of $41 million for literacy, this bill provides $100 million. Instead of zero dollars in school property tax relief, this bill provides $270 million. Instead of a litany of mandates, this bill provides few and far between. Members, this is what districts have been asking for. This is what your superintendent and school boards have been asking for. A 5 and 5% 5 increase to the, fu the fu uh, funding formula. Billions of dollars toward the special ed education cross subsidy, money for safe schools and literacy, all without strings attached. This amendment isn't gutting or removing any of those other programs. As a matter of fact, this amendment is going to be the way that we ensure the schools actually get those funds and don't have the costly mandates that would require them to get rid of those programs. So, Mr. President, this is an easy amendment to uh, support. It's things that many of us have advocated both as Republicans and Democrats for in the past. Let's make it a reality and vote green. Thank you. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I will admit there are some very good provisions in the READ Act that is in this bill, and that was a difficult discussion that we had in, uh, for this amendment to remove it. And I believe we will get there. Senator May Quaid will continue to work on that and make a few more changes that uh, some of us are looking at. And I think in the end, uh, that is going to be something we will be looking at. I don't believe it's completely ready, and that's part of the reason we uh, did this. But what I want to talk about, too, is this is a very complicated issue area. There are so many things that we can look at funding in education finance. And what I tend to worry about so many times is we start to look at so many things and we have so many proposals coming at us that we end up watering down the help that actually gets into our classrooms. And I know there were concerns that were brought up about the English language cross-subsidy, early learning, nurses, mental health, so many other areas. We can direct money to certain things, and what we end up doing when we do that and we create other mandates is we just create new cross-subsidies for our schools. Mr. President, this proposal looks to say we are going to give school districts the most flexibility to do what they need. I was amazed at how many school districts would come in and they talked about all the different things that they did in their schools because they looked at the needs. Some schools came in and said, hey, we've already prioritized it. We have a school nurse. Others came in and said, we've prioritized mental health and we have the counselors. We made that a priority for our students. You can go down the, the list of all the things that we talk about and certain schools have prioritized that and thus, they don't need new directed funding for that particular area because they've already figured out their way of doing it. So our proposal is saying, schools, we believe you're going to look at what you need most, and this provides them the most flexibility to use their general fund dollars to do the things their families are asking for. One of the other things that I struggle with, Mr. President, you know, we heard about the grants that are available in this bill. So many of our small districts, they don't have the assistance to help with writing school grants, and by the time they get it and get their application in, those grants can be used up. So I much prefer that we have that direct funding 
on the formula going to our schools that gets out to our schools in the most balanced way. Now, as we heard earlier today, there are still some tweaks that I believe over time we need to address. Um, we're having some growing uh, disparities as we continue to add money to the formula, but this is still the most equitable way to get money to every school by putting it on the formula, and then they can address the needs they have. So, Mr. President, again, we can't address all the mandates that are out there in all the other bills. We can address what's in this bill, and we can give this money to our school districts in the way that gives them the most flexibility to deal with the needs they have in their very unique school districts in the ways that their families are asking. Please vote yes. The Secretary will take the roll on the A-10 amendment to the amendment. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Latz votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. Mr. President. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Dreheim votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. Senator Westrom votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 35 noes, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Members, just to make sure that we are on the same page, we are now on the A-1 amendment. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I will withdraw the A-1 amendment. Senator Rarick withdraws the A-1 amendment. Any additional amendments? Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 2497, a bill for an act relating to education finance, providing funding for pre-kindergarten through grade 12 education. Third reading. I'm doing the list, Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. My administrators in the, my schools have done the math. As math is a part of education, I would have assumed that some in this chamber would have done so as well, but I evidently was wrong. I will be sure to tell my administrators, however, that the majority party here believes that they are hysterical based on a statement made earlier this evening. They have been victims of the old bait and switch before. Now, we're going to give you some money, but we're also going to take a whole bunch of money in terms of the mandates that we propose. They and us recognize, Mr. President, that the mandates of which we speak are not all included in this bill. And yet, this is the bill which will reimburse them for the cost that they will incur in having to meet the mandates that this legislature passes. And if the legislature passes all the mandates that have been proposed in different areas, this bill will be woefully short. The unemployment insurance alone has been stated to take 2% of the formula increase that is being offered. And there are those who really question, Mr. President, the total estimate of the unemployment insurance, that it will be much more than currently stated. Last year has been mentioned that no money was there for education. Well, Mr. President, you can talk to the governor and the House about that plug that was pulled. And Mr. President, I thank Senator Duckworth for providing honest information about that situation. My fellow caucus members have stated exact situations within their districts. And I won't review specific numbers that I have received from my school districts. 
However, I will state that based on the information I have received, if all the mandates are passed and the funding remains as it is, most of my districts will see an $800 to $1,000 plus deficit per student of costs over income. My local school's option, Mr. President, they are to either raise the levy substantially and increase property taxes for its citizens or cut programs, and probably both. My administrators tell me, put money on the formula, provide money for the cross-section subsidy, and for goodness sakes, knock off the mandates. If this bill and all the proposed amendments are passed, Mr. President, this session will not be known as the session of historic funding of education. It will be known as the historic session of defunding education in Minnesota. We are told to support this bill for our education. Mr. President, in support of my schools, I must vote no. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate all the discussion. And um, I've been through a lot of education bills, and here's another one, and I appreciate uh, the intention of Senator Kunish and Senator Swazinski and all the other members of the Finance Committee, uh, Education and Finance, which I wish I could be on again. But um, so, you know, a lot of times we talk about the formula. Um, I talk to my district and I have notes on a piece of paper, but it's not some kind of big sheet. Um, nothing's free, Mr. President. And there's many things that are being funded in this session that people deem valuable. Uh, the uh, paid family leave and unemployment for, um, for some of the seasonal workers, which, by the way, I'm an I'm author on that latter one. And I can see some benefits on the former, uh, the family leave piece. But none of those are free. And so when my district adds up those numbers, it's almost 3% that it's going to cost to pay the unemployment. I, they asked my fiscal person, I said, are you sure? They said, yeah, $8.4 million, and 1% is 2.9. It's like, wow, that's a lot. And with the family leave program, and for all the benefits that it may provide to individuals and you know, who would not want to help some of those folks. Mr. President, point of order. For what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, do we have to keep our comments uh, remaining on what's in this bill? Um, uh, Senator, sorry, uh, we, point of parliamentary inquiry. <laughs> so, what's your uh, point of parli parliamentary inquiry, and what rule are you rooting it in? Thank you, Mr. President. I'm wondering if we have to keep uh, comments on the bill related to what's in the bill and not on other topics in the bill, or not in the bill. Excuse me. Uh, members, um, I, we often uh, do in third reading give people a little more latitude as it pertains to what they're thinking about uh, uh, as it pertains to this bill. And members, I, I also would like to refer you so gently to the rules because I don't like when individuals are interrupted if they don't have to be interrupted. So your point is well taken, but I'm just, this is just a good time to remind the, the members to be pointed and focused uh, and just be respectful of the fact that we have other members that want to speak as well. So with that being said, the gentle reminder, Senator Abler, Mr. President, I appreciate the gentleness, and Senator May Quaid, I will, you know, I, I get the point. I'm, I'm not with to digress or be dilatory, but the, the bottom line, uh, while well, the marketing on this bill is that it's a four or five, for my district has the effect just from those two elements that are not in, not in this bill, but they are in the, the package of education funding, and that's what this bill is. My district's going to get the effect of a zero and a one on the formula, which is hard to bargain a nice contract for the teachers on there for all the hopes they were. Um, Mr. President, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned um, about a bunch of things in the package of bills that are before us and even some of the items here. And uh, we discussed um, people are choosing to not attend public school, Mr. President. Uh, with this funding. They are choosing to fund their own. They're choosing to go online. They're choosing to go somewhere else. 
And part of that is because they see a heavy hand from the state um, on some of these uh, issues. Um, uh, some of the staff doesn't feel safe in the schools. Uh, we talked about um, staffers in a particular school that were afraid to do hallway monitoring. Um, and that concerns me, it concerns people. Uh, we have concerns about, um, well, there's just a lot of concerns, and I, I'm just disappointed. I, I may actually vote for the bill because my district needs some money to pay for all this stuff, and I'm an optimist. Um, but I, I don't remember seeing a target this big, Mr. President, with the net, and, and there, there is some good things. There's a cost subsidy. It gives a, my district $9 million, which they can certainly use. Um, but I think as a package, the majority could have done better to make sure that we truly fund. This is, this is supposed to be the bill that fully funded education. I remember the governor was so excited. Like, this is it. This is the one. And I don't remember ever having a target this big. Mr. President, usually we would have to live with the money for the entire budget that this budget spends in just a one biennium just on this topic. So, but I can tell you, and just to remind members, that now, no matter what happens with the, if we lose three, five, ten percent, there's still gonna be 70, 80 percent of the students in the state going to traditional public schools. And it's our duty to make sure that they have the opportunity. And Mr. President, I look forward to hopefully this process getting better. It's really surprising. I've sat through a lot of speeches about uh, a bill that I was in the majority on and like, well, it's going to come back better, I hope. But it's amazing when the, the denomination is this large. I hope it comes back better. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westlin. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> thank you, Senator Kunish, and thank you to all the members of the committee. <clears throat> this was hard work, and as I think was said earlier uh, this evening, education finance is complicated, and it was an interesting committee to be on as a freshman. Um, I'm very proud of the work that we did. This is an historic bill. This is funding for education, uh, K E through 12 education, that we have not seen for so, so many years, because we have underfunded education, including many other things in our state. I was proud to be the chief author for the special education funding bill. And we are, in fact, making, again, a historic investment in special education services. We are committing more funds than we have in a generation. And in this next biennium, we will be providing almost $654 million for special education and just over $1 billion in the tails. That will cover 40% of the special ed cross subsidy for fiscal year 24, 473 in fiscal, fiscal year 25, and 60% in fiscal year 26 and 27. And by comparison, the state currently only provides about 6.4%. So this is a big, big deal, and I am so proud uh, to have carried that bill. I was also pleased to work with the Minnesota Council on Economic Studies to provide grants um, to train our teachers so that they can teach our students about economic educational uh, topics and personal finance. I had a high school student in my district approach me early in session, and she had been working with her grandmother on a service learning grant bill. And I was so pleased to carry that bill and that we are able to provide funding for that as well. And lastly, I also was the chief author for the bill that does require paid orientation and professional training for our paraprofessionals, the people who, who work so intimately and so closely with our students, and especially with our students who may have special needs. Again, Mr. President, we've heard a lot on the floor today, but the, the bottom line is this is a good bill. This is a good bill for our schools. Do our schools need more? They probably do. They've been starved for so long. But I am so pleased to have been part of this process, and I will very proudly and gladly vote green. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Last year, 
Democrats ran on a platform of fully funding education. They promised to put more money into the classroom and to close achievement gaps. Members, this bill falls far short of that goal. Senator Kunder stated she had a $2.5 billion target, the largest ever. Yet school districts, as we have heard over and over, are saying if we pass this record funding, the mandate it's embedded in this bill and other labor bills moving through this body that will affect them will cause them to make budget cuts. Just one example. We just talked about it. There's a new mandate that extends unemployment insurance to support personnel. These are employees in a collective bargaining agreement that have agreed to work a certain number of days. Would Senator Kunis yield for a quick question? Senator Kunis will yield. She will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Senator, or Mr. President. Senator Kunish, how much do you expect that this mandate will cost school districts? Senator Kunish, to the question. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, uh, President, would you ask Senator Pratt which mandate I wasn't, I didn't catch it. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kunish, I was talking about the new unemployment mandate, how much that will cost our local districts. Senator Kunish. Well, um, Senator Pratt, um, I can't say per, uh, per district, but I will say that um, we, when we put this bill together, we um, uh, expect that 1% of each of the biennium, 1% of the formula in each year of the biennium would, good, would go towards um, that unemployment insurance and it would come down to about $720 per student or $72 million um, dollars a year. So the unemployment uh, costs, because we don't know what they are, um, are baked into the, um, the formula. And so let's say those dollars are distributed across uh, the districts. Uh, if there were dollars that were unused after they had um, set aside maybe that 1%, if those dollars are not spent, those dollars go back into the school district, into their general fund. So in essence, um, this could become um, a, you know, a valuable asset when it comes to uh, putting dollars into the general fund. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Kunis yield for another question? Senator Pratt, uh, Pratt uh, Senator Kunis will yield. Thank Senator you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator Kunis, last week in finance, you stated, testified that the unemployment expense would roughly be about $135 million a year, and that, and, and, and as, as I do the math, that comes up to be about 2% on the formula. So, Senator Kunish, can you explain what changed between finance and now and also what was in the, uh, the original fiscal note as far as the expected benefit? Senator Kunis, to the question. Uh, Senator Pratt, unfortunately, I don't have the fiscal note with me. And... Uh, Perhaps I wasn't clear last week when I said 2%, meaning 2% for, for, the, for the biennium. Um, and so, again, it would be 1% the first year and 1% the second year. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I, I guess I'm extremely concerned with the answers I'm getting tonight because, as you'll recall, when we were in finance, we went quite a ways down this road leading us to go to the Rules Committee and eventually have a hearing on this bill this morning, where again we talked about the idea that this was going to cost school districts $135 million, roughly $158 per pupil unit. And schools are even saying that it's going to be closer to $200 million or $230 per pupil unit. And Senator Kunish was very clear the other day that she added 2% to the formula to cover the cost of this. And I asked her specifically, so Senator, that if that meant that the net 
after just unemployment, if the net to school districts would be 2% and 3%, and she answered in the affirmative. Would Senator Marty yield for a question? Senator Marty, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Senator, or Mr. President. Senator Marty, as we just discussed, uh, the fiscal note claims that the uh, unemployment insurance alone is expected to be about $135 million, but schools are telling us that understates the impact that they will face. Now, the fiscal note was drafted before Senator Kunish took away the funding mechanism and stated that there was money in the formula to cover this cost. And so this is falling entirely on the local school boards and school districts and communities. Uh, Senator Marty, given that this will have such a large local impact, did you and Senator Kunish ever discuss a local impact note? Senator Marty, to the question. Mr. President, Senator Pratt, when the, um, I had seen the fiscal note with the 135 million on it, and I, I actually think that's going to be very high for what the actual cost will be. But um, again, when the committee put the bill together, and this was said all along, I never saw that they had an, uh, line item for this. I always heard it was going to be covered by the other costs. And this gets to the whole issue before we had an amendment about how maybe we, these are unfunded mandates if we didn't have a line item for them. And I, I frankly think if the committee, if Senator Kunish's committee had put together a bill with that with line items for every item, I think the school boards would be complaining that we didn't give them any flexibility to do their work. I think they'd be saying they'd much prefer to have general fund increase, the formula increases, and let them figure out how to cover the costs. And frankly, with something like the unemployment, I think one of the things they're likely to do is find ways to, um, to use these employees in ways that they may not apply for UI because they're going to have summer positions. That won't work all the time, but I think there's some incentive to do that. But I realistically think it's going to be less than $135 million. And I also think that if Senator Kunish had chosen to put this into a separate line item appropriation for this, that that would cause a problem more than giving the school districts more money. This is $2.5 billion, I think. Um, 2.2 when you're not counting the early childhood. Put that money into there. I think most school districts and would prefer to have a little more flexibility in how they do it, and they're told you got to cover this, you have to cover that. But let them do the work. So I think that um, she is covering the costs in that, and I think it's, you're saying because it's not a line item, therefore it's not covered, I think it is. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President, will Senator Marty yield for another question? Senator Marty will yield. He will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Senator Marty, my question was not where was the separate line item for this. My question was that the fiscal note anticipated $135 million a yearly cost on this, roughly $158 per pupil unit. Um, at the time the fiscal note was done, there was a funding mechan mechanism that was contemplated. Now we're putting this onto the schools and it's supposed to be covered through their basic education funding. There seems to be some discrepancy. You think it might be less. School districts think it might cost more. My question to you was, was there ever any conversation between you and Senator Kunish when the funding mechanism was changed to perform a local impact note to understand that cost? Not that you believe it's going to be less, not believe that schools it's going to be more, but we do an actual assessment. Senator Marty, to the question. Sure, Mr. President, Senator Pratt. Um, relying on the fiscal notes, I told you I think it's high and you think some others think it's low, but the bottom line is when the Senate is providing funding for covering it, we don't, I've never seen a need for a fiscal note when we're paying the cost of something. So, no, I did not ask for a local fiscal note. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, may I just uh, take a second to correct Senator Marty, and maybe he'll want to... I didn't ask for a local fiscal note. I asked for a local impact note. That was the question, Senator Marty. 
Senator Pratt, I'm sorry if you said something. I did hear you. Thank you. Mr. President, I've been asking Senator Marty whether he requested a local impact note. Members, our fiscal notes cover the cost to state government. They don't talk about the costs of these mandates onto our local communities. And my question to Senator Marty was, did he request a local impact note? Did he request an assessment that we would go out and ask our local school boards and school, or our local school districts what they think this might cost? It's a real simple question. It's not about creating a line item on a fiscal note. It's not about asking for a new fiscal note. It's about asking what the impact's going to be. The original bill had a funding source. And Senator Kunish, in Finance Committee, stated this impact alone was going to take nearly half of the per, per pupil funding increase to cover half of the money that we are giving to schools to cover teacher salaries, to cover salaries for these very people that we're looking to cover through unemployment insurance, for textbooks, for, for bus drivers, for all the operations, electricity, every expense that the school district has. That's what this money is meant to go to, the basic operations of the school district. And yes, even to cover some special ed costs because we fail to fully cover the, the cross subsidy that Democrats com com campaigned on. So, Mr. President, we have the author and we have the Senate Finance Chair saying, we understand that this is going to be a burden on our local districts, and we did not take the time and effort to actually figure out what that might be. Senator Kunish states, we can't afford to spend additional money on the formula and save schools. Instead, she stated we would have to cut grants made in this bill. Mr. President, local school board members have election certificates, and they look just like ours. Statute 123B.09, the care, management, and control of independent districts is vested in the school is vested in a board of directors to be known as the school board. I am amazed at the comments that some members made where they believe they think they know more than our local schools. Their experience or the needs of their district absolutely must be the needs of all school districts across the state. Well, I can tell you, Mr. President, the needs of Shakopee are much different than the needs of St. Cloud. The needs of Prior Lake are much different than the needs of Pelican Lake. And yet, here we are with a one-size-fits-all bill. One senator tonight, I was kind of surprised, was so upset. And I'll paraphrase what I, what I, what I heard. She was disappointed that the schools wouldn't spend the money the way that she wanted them to. This bill goes far into micromanaging our school districts. So, Mr. President, while Senator Kuna states that this historic funding of 4 and 5 percent is, is still falling short of fully funding our schools as was promised, by her own description, it's really a 2 and 3 percent increase, and yet Republicans have offered us a way to meet the basic needs of schools, to meet the big needs of schools. This is an education finance bill that falls short of what we should be giving our local communities. This will not move the dial on closing the achievement gap. This will not move the dial on making sure that our classroom teachers have the resources that they need. Mr. President, we need to vote no on this bill. And let's take it back and have the right discussion, like, like the amendment that Senator Rarick pr proposed, 
that provides money on the basic formula and meets the needs of schools and gives those decisions to the local districts to meet the needs that they have, that provides significant money to save schools. And let's reinstate and recognize the election certificates that our, that our local community members have. Thank you. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. I am a proud product of Minnesota public schools, um, all through the grade schools and even through college. And I didn't realize at the time what a phenomenal public education I was getting compared to some places in the country. And that I was at least feeling some of the benefits of what was called the Minnesota miracle and really unparalleled investment in public education. And I didn't realize how good I had it until as an adult, I moved for work and I ended up in other states that did not value public education. And if you really wanted your kids to actually have a chance, you had to put them in public schools, which just gutted public schools even more when the good parents were taking their kids out. And so many kids were left behind. And that is something I absolutely do not want to happen here in Minnesota. Every child deserves a quality education. And this bill has so many amazing things in it and such an outstanding investment with its 2.5 billion after years of underfunding and sometimes even no additional funding. This is so needed and so important. I'm not gonna go through every single thing, uh, but let me just talk about one area that's very important to me. I think our teachers take so much, especially in recent years with misinformation. Sometimes they're criticized unfairly, uh, attacked verbally, sometimes even physically. Um, class sizes are getting larger, less support staff. So let me talk as a foster parent, as is someone who has worked with disability children and children in need. All of that support staff is so critical because teachers are our front line for kids. So if a child is hungry, if a child has a learning disability, a medical illness that needs to be diagnosed, or heaven forbid they're being abused, a lot of times it's the teacher that assesses that and gets the child the help they need. But when the class sizes are getting too large, what they are, and when we have to keep cutting support staff, which we do, so now we don't have a nurse, so now we might not have a counselor, now we might not have all those things, kids fall through the cracks because the teachers can't do it all. So I am so glad that we are beefing up all of this funding and all of the support staff to help those children get the help they need and also help the teachers do their best and feel supported and honored in their jobs. And I wanna mention again, the early childhood portion of this. As I said earlier, the brain development from zero to three is the most critical time in a child's life. We have at least 35,000 low-income children who could benefit from different early learning programs. So the fact that we are adding into Head Start, early learning scholarships, grow your own, uh, getting more childhood early learning teachers, um, just funding them so that we have more of those teachers is critical to setting up children for success in life. And as I said, the developmental screening for children who might have disabilities, if we can catch that early, 
That is their whole life that could be transformed. Because the earlier you start dealing with disabilities and a support structure and being able to work with that, the more successful the outcome for the child. So I will be voting green on this for all the reasons in the bill, but especially because it gives our kids the support they need going through their lives and invest in our children so that every child has a chance to be a quality product of our public education, just like I am, and maybe be the next kid to stand here today down the road. Thank you. Members, as a gentle reminder, we have more than 10 people on the list. So if we keep going at this rate, we're going to be here for quite some time. I don't mind, but I just thought I would remind you. We are now going to Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I promise to be brief. To be honest, members, I'm quite stunned. Somehow, Democrats in power are managing to put record funding into the education spending formula while also managing to mandate our schools into bankruptcy. I know this because I sent the bills in question to my local school districts. And here's what I heard back. The Democrats' plan for one of them will, at best, their words, force them to dip into their rainy day funds. The other districts I heard back from are looking at a much bleaker picture, saying that their plans will force them into the red by millions of dollars. Through an amendment here today, Senate Republicans offered a funding formula that would reverse this course and prevent the damage before it's done. We offered more money for the special education cross-subsidy, more money for literacy, more money on the formula that goes directly into the classrooms and took out the burdensome mandates. Now, don't get me wrong. I am so grateful that my colleagues across the aisle are passionate about investing heavily into our schools, and I share that passion. But I am devastated that they are willing to squander this unique opportunity that we have with the surplus by refusing to give up these mandates on our schools that, at the end of the day, will bankrupt them. Our school districts, our hardworking teachers, but most importantly, our students who are counting on us here today, who are still struggling after the pandemic, deserve so much better than what we are offering them here today. To those who have been reaching out to me, saying how negatively impact you will be by these policies, please know that Republicans heard you, and we tried our best here to fix this. We were outvoted, but our fight will continue. Members, please vote no. We can do better than to bankrupt our schools. Thank you. Senator May Quaid. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, it is a great day to pass an education budget. I, I'm just giddy, Mr. President. That's just, that's just real. I'm giddy right now. I want to talk a little bit about some things I love in this bill. Early childhood. I have the privilege and honor of carrying the early learning scholarship funding. This is going to be so huge. It expands eligibility to 200% of the federal poverty level for children zero to three years old. This is going to dramatically change the early learning experiences of some of the neediest children in Minnesota. And as Senator Mitchell talked about, that brain development in zero to three and zero to five is so crucial to the foundation that exists for the rest of their life. $270 million into early learning scholarships is a good day to pass a bill. Mr. President, we have tens of millions of dollars in this bill to help every child learn how to read and to help their educators learn how to teach them how to read and for curriculum and for reimbursement if districts already did the right thing buying curriculum. And we didn't do a grant program, so districts don't have to spend time writing out grants to get the money. They just send their teachers to the professional development training. We send them the money, they're good to go. Mr. President, we're doing paid orientation for paraprofessionals. We have full service community schools. We have increased Teachers of Color Act. 
every single provision paid for, reducing the English language learner cross-subsidy, the special education cross-subsidy. When I marched in a parade, Mr. President, this summer, I was carrying a sign with all of the things I wanted to do, and we all carried signs. The cross-subsidy for special education, biggest applause line after reproductive rights. This is a great, great bill. I want to talk a little bit about unemployment insurance, because it is funded in this bill. But I want to talk about the hourly workers who work in our schools. They feed our children. They drive them to school. They're like the first people they see in the morning. They teach them how to tie their shoe, walk them to the bathroom, help them read their books. These are the hourly workers who get paid the least, and they have been excluded from the unemployment insurance system. Why? Well, we know why. Because the people who typically do this work are women and people of color. And like so many systems that we have in this state and in this nation, we write people like that out of our policies all the time. And so when we include them now, so that the people who make the least amount in our schools, when they're not employed in the summer, can make half their wage if they happen to be unemployed and didn't have summer employment, so they can still feed their families, so they can still afford to put gas in their car, so they can still afford to pay the rent or the electric bill. That is the unfunded mandate that we keep hearing about, is stopping balancing the budgets of our districts on the backs of these workers, which we fund in this bill. That's what we keep hearing about. So let's just like put words to what we keep hearing about, is actually taking care of the workers who take care of our children every day. It's a good day to pass a bill, Mr. President. We are funding that. This is a great bill. And I understand that some of my colleagues in this chamber, Mr. President, have problems with other bills. And because this one's so good, had to talk about those instead of this one. I get it. It's really, really hard to hate a bill that puts $2.2 billion into our schools. And so you got to like add a bunch of stuff to a spreadsheet to be like, no, it's not good. But it is. And we know it is. And that's why it's such a good day to pass a bill. So I am a huge green vote on this bill, Mr. President. And I urge members to vote yes. Thank you. Senator Cron. Thank you, Mr. President. Being on the school board requires often uh, a comprehensive analysis of the needs of the entire district in putting students first. Not this particular stakeholder or that particular stakeholder, um, but the needs of the students in finding a way to deliver academic excellence while being fiscally responsible. I too have talked to the districts, uh, the school districts in my in my district, and um, it, it paints a similar picture. Spring Lake Park um, is looking at about 4.8 million in new revenue a year, and uh, almost 6.4 million in uh, new mandates, and that does not even count the paid family leave bill. Forest Lake uh, factored in the paid family leave bill; they have about 4.7 in new revenue, over 10 million and new mandates. Uh, Anoka Hennepin, the largest school district in the state, um, just the extending unemployment to the hourly employees is going to constitute 72% of the formula increase, just that one mandate alone. And Centennial, Mr. President, called the unemployment to the hourly employees untenable, and the other mandates deeply disturbing. And I understand that not all the mandates are in this bill, but they are all active in the legislature right now, and they're all real to our school districts. The school districts don't care whether those mandates are in this particular bill. They are out there, and they're real, and it matters to them, which is why we need maximum flexibility to our school districts in how they're able to spend the money that is in this bill. We don't need more unfunded mandates. School boards and superintendents are in the best position to know what their district and what their students need. School boards are the most responsive to the community, and they're the closest to the community, and they understand what their community needs the most. We in the legislature here should not operate as a super school board, dictating to districts what they need and how they should spend their money. 
Being on the school board, I know that we've made investments in a lot of these areas. We may not need in our school district some of these things that this bill is dictating on how we spend the money. We've already addressed them, but we may need things that aren't in here. We need that flexibility. And Mr. President, I'll just end with this. It, it, it's, we had an opportunity to get this right with the Republican amendment that would have provided all the funding in a much more flexible way. And it's mind blowing to me that we can spend this much money and our districts still end up worse off. The economics of this bill are irresponsible and requires a no vote. Thank you. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Senator Kunish for putting together this bill. This bill funds education in a way that hasn't been done in six years. On December 8th of last year, I put in my last day at the high school I worked at to take on this job. I had 230 students on my roster. I'm a world history teacher. Um, it's a great job, but 230 students on your roster is a lot of responsibility. It's really easy to get burned out on those numbers. I heard from a lot of people in this room today about education and what they think is good or bad about it. Um, a lot of people probably haven't been in a school, though, um, since they were a student, and that's probably a while ago. So as a teacher, as a current teacher, I'm proud of what this bill does. Somebody who's just recently in the classroom, a formula increase of this size is going to make a huge dif a difference. We have money in here for mental health support, money for school counselors, special education cross-subsidy increase that we haven't seen in maybe ever, ELL subsidy, the READ Act, money for math core, after school learning, early learning resources, and programs to recruit and train more teachers. These are genuinely things that help, genuinely things that will make a difference. I've also talked to my school boards, and yes, they have some concerns, but that's probably because for the last six years they haven't been properly funded and they have a hard time trusting anybody in this room. We are currently operating right now on a 0% increase on the formula. So we are in right now a Republican education school budget and it doesn't feel good. So they're gonna have a hard time believing us when we say that we are here to help, but we are. The money on this formula looks a lot different than what they've seen in the past. So. We can keep talking about education, and we should. In fact, it's my favorite subject, so we should talk about it all the time. But I just want to remind somebody, or people, that as a current teacher, this is good. These are real changes that we need, and I'm very happy to vote green on this bill. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I would encourage people to look at the previous funding numbers before they comment on, comment on them. Uh, but uh, Mr. Uh, President and members, I would, uh, you know, as a former education chair and former teacher, I, I do want to um, compliment uh, Senator Kunish on the bill that she's put together here. We're glad to see the historic target I do want to speak to the budget just so, because that is, everything falls under this budget. The current budget is 20.142 billion dollars for the biennium. People have been talking about just the increase. I think it's important that we talk about the total budget. The budget proposal for the, for this upcoming biennium is $24.29 billion. And the out biennium, the budget, is proposed to be $25.268 billion. So there is significant funding here and needed funding. But let me say the previous years were continued to have uh, increases in funding even though there were fewer students. However, that's not the point of the conversation tonight. Tonight, we're looking at the bill before us and the possibilities that it brings. And there's a lot to like in the bill that we've been discussing. There are things like 
the formula increases, four and five, four percent and five percent. There are the special ed cross subsidy, the EL, the uh, English learner cross subsidy. These things are critical pieces that we've done in the past, but they are coming forward here, particularly that increase in the per pupil funding. Those are good things. But it's hard to imagine that with such massive increases, in fact, this biennium upcoming has a $2.5 billion increase, and the out biennium is $3.3 billion over the 20 four and $25 billion budget we spoke of. So it's really kind of hard to believe with those vast resources that there are some omissions in the bill. There are some important things that are in the bill, but they didn't warrant uh, what I saw as any increases. And these are things that are important to our schools. For example, I did not see an increase in the Safe Schools Aid. Something started a few years ago when I was Ed Chair that have been, has been really important for our school districts. Um, and then I also did not see an increase in the Safe School Levy. I think those are critical. Of course, the mental health concerns have continued to grow, and it looks like on the chart showing the increases over the, um, over the forecast funding, I did not see an increase for school linked mental health. That's one of the things that our school districts have continued to say is so important to have those mental health services right in the schools. So there's a few, there's a few omissions there. But then, members, even in spite of this massive funding, there is a clunker in this bill that I do not know. It is so egregious, I don't know if I'm going to be able to vote for this bill. And I think I see Senator Weger up there. He and I have stood on this floor for a number of years uh, talking about uh, education funding. And it's amazing that the, this massive funding is actually going to not be used to pay for the things that are being mandated. I'm just talking about the one thing in this bill, which is the unemployment insurance. That is a new mandate, 100% not paid for, and it is going to, as my school district said, eat up, use the funding that, would, that they had set aside for increasing teacher salaries. And we have a teacher shortage. And it's a critical, and those salaries are low to start with. So it's amazing to me that we could have new, so much new money, over $5 billion, it appears, on top of the already $24 billion budget, and somehow we're not able to fund the unemployment for part-time workers and our hourly staff. And let me not be misconstrued here. Those workers, those hourly staff, those paras are critically important. When I started my first teaching job, my dad, a high school principal, told me two things. He said, on your first day, Carla, it is critically important that you make sure that you get to know the custodian and the secretary. They have different titles today. But these people are, as one of our testifiers say, the glue that holds our schools together. But the problem here is that the unemployment insurance mandate is not being funded, even with significant, significant resources. That is a problem. That is a huge issue that's going to make it very difficult uh, to support this bill. So. Lots, there are lots of good things, but it's difficult to imagine that we would be putting our school districts in such financial stress, not even let, letting them levy for this increased cost. So members, um, I'm going to be debating within myself 
about this bill. It would be the first education finance bill I have not voted for since I got here 15 years ago, if in fact that is the case. So members, lots to think about. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. I will be brief as it's late and we are tired and we have worked hard all day doing this work. Um, but I rise in joyful, strong support of this omnibus bill. I want to give my sincere thanks to uh, Chair Kunish um, for all of the work that she and her committee did to put together this truly remarkable bill that is going to be a game changer in so many ways. I am so proud of so many of the provisions that are in this bill and so excited to vote for them. And I am particularly um, thankful to Chair Kunish to have the foresight and the political courage and the commitment to people to include my bill that would remove the exclusion that currently prevents hourly paid school workers from being able to apply for and receive unemployment insurance. Uh, Chair Kunish is, is paying for doing this. So not only are, are, we, are we going to improve so many lives, thousands of people's lives, Minnesotans across the state, but we're paying for that. We're helping pay for that. And um, I, I have heard some words um, that have been, I, that I'd really like us to turn from and, and switch gears from. And you know, um, I'm very thankful to um, Senator Mary Quaid who had beautiful things to say about our bill, um, this portion of the bill earlier. And one of the things that she said that I want to reiterate for all of us is that these workers have been historically excluded, specifically historically excluded. All the while, other workers were brought into the employment benefit, those workers were left out. And the thing is, these workers are disproportionately, grossly disproportionately, over 70% women today. Disproportionately people of color, disproportionately older workers, older than 50, many of them. And they're paid very low wages. And I... I hear some of the arguments that have happened throughout our debate tonight, and I just gotta, I gotta say how convenient it is that we hear sort of a recoil when it comes to truly delivering for these workers. These are the people who make our society run. They're the people who we called heroes through the course of the pandemic essential workers. They do the work that makes our society run and they have been purposefully excluded for decades from this very basic workers' rights benefit that everybody else can qualify for and receive when they need it. So when I hear things like, that portion of this bill, it's a clunker, or that, that part of the bill is gonna eat up and use all, of, uh, all of, the, of the money. No, that is not true. Change is hard. I understand that change could be a little scary. But colleagues, I appeal to you, dig deep and realize that this is the right thing to do, that we must do this, that it is long overdue, and that those workers who we paid lip service to over the course of the pandemic, now is the time for us to truly show them that we mean it. We cannot treat these workers as a second-class workforce 
any longer. We cannot balance our school's budgets on their backs. So colleagues, I, I again, um, I also am a graduate of our public schools and I am the daughter of a public school teacher and the spouse of a public school teacher and um, have kids in our public schools and I, I, am, I just take so much happiness today in supporting this bill and this work, this tremendous work um, that Senator Kunish and um, our colleagues have done to put this bill together. So I ask for all of your support, for your political courage in moving forward and doing the right thing. Thank you. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President, members. The, um, the surplus we have is huge. It's historic. $19 billion, uh, the first act that Democrats did fiscally here is uh, built inflation into the future, so they spent a billion and a half of that. Now it's, the, the discussion is around $17.5 billion or $17.6 billion that's left. Those are the numbers that are around this budget. Uh, actually, the increase, Mr. President, is $20.2 billion over the current biennium is what the spending is we're looking at. Senator Nelson went through some of the numbers. Um, a $2.5 billion increase in spending in the first year of the biennium, another 3.3% uh, th $3.3 billion increase the second year, uh, 5.8 billion dollar increase in spending in the area of K through 12 education. A huge amount of money, uh, which you would expect when we have a huge, huge over collection of the people's money that's accumulating here in St. Paul between now and June 30th of next year. Mr. President, that's nearly a third of the surplus that's represented in this bill, the largest finance bill we've had before us yet. And so what does it do? Now I've heard from some of my school districts too, members, I have 20 school districts either wholly or partially included in the Senate District that I represent, Senate District 20. I've heard back from some of the superintendents, they are gravely concerned at this budget. They are shocked at the fact that this is a historic infusion of state money into their budgets and they're going to leave this budget calculation behind where they first started, Mr. President. That's, that's shocking to them that we have the Democrats bringing a budget uh, that for one school district, uh, they suggested their increase from this bill in income is going to be between 1.4 or 1.37 and 1.43 million dollars for their, for their small school district. The increase in expenses from all of these state mandates that are being forced down to them through the Democrats that are acting as a super duper school, state school board here uh, through this bill, 3.32 million to 3.6 million dollars of expenses. Now that's gonna create f only for this school board as an example, or for this school district, Mr. President, a $1.9 to $2.1 billion deficit caused by the Democrat mandates that are in this bill and others that they're bringing forward through the, the various uh, budget proposal items, some of which we have yet to see. So we are seeing, even though it's a historic increase in spending, we're going to leave school districts They'd be better off that we didn't do anything. They'd be better off that we'd adjourn than pass what Democrats are proposing in this bill, its laden mandates and all the mandates left to come. There's a problem here, Mr. President, and our school districts know it. Instead of us acting like a super school district, telling that uh, our local schools have to pay people who signed up to work for nine months of the year 
Instead, school district, you have to pay them for 12 months of the year. There's, their contract, Mr. President, is for nine months, not 12. That's what they signed up for. As a matter of fact, I'm told many of these employees, they enjoy taking the summer off, and that's part of their plans. That's why they signed up for the job to begin with, Mr. President. We have Democrats here trying to force these mandates onto our school districts. It's going to bankrupt them and force them to do one thing, and that is to raise property taxes on the fine people of Minnesota who are already getting smoked by Democrat fiscal policy, and they're only making it worse. We'll find out this summer and next fall uh, if this uh, survives, which it probably will. It'll probably be signed into law by the governor after the Democrats pass it here. Uh, we have truth and taxation hearings happening end of this year, Mr. President, and we will hear uh, we will hear the screeches from the people of Minnesota around what is happening in our school districts and why did school property taxes get raised up so much. It's because Democrats are placing our school districts in a deficit with the budget proposals they are bringing and forcing upon you, the fine people of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. President. I would um, encourage all of us to talk to our superintendents and just ask them, um, so last year, literally a year ago this week probably, we as a body sent to Conf Education Conference Committee a $30 million bill. That's what we were spending on education, $30 million with a $9 billion surplus. And that, ask those superintendents and school boards, did they would they prefer that again this year, or would they prefer the $2.2 billion that we are um, giving them through a wide variety of programs that will help with counselors and reading programs and class sizes and all the wonderful things that are going to be in this bill that I think at some point um, school districts in the state are going to be singing the praises of the legislature after this session adjourns. I just want to thank um, Senator Kuhn for all of her hard work this um, um, for the last few months and and the proudest part of this bill for me is um, um, literally the very first sentence in the entire bill which reads a school district or charter school must provide students access to menstrual products at no charge those are the very first words in Senator Kunish's bill and um, 51 years ago we passed Title IX. Title IX passed in 1972, and literally, Title IX says, prohibited sex-based discrimination in our schools. Title IX prohibits sex-based discrimination in our schools. I hope providing menstrual products is the last sexual discrimination taking place in our schools. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eric, and then we will go to the author of the bill. Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. You know, as, a, as someone who's been in the legislature for eight years, you think you get a good background on all of the issues that are before you, but uh, my first year this year on education finance and being the lead of uh, the Republican caucus here, you start to realize pretty quickly just how in-depth this subject area is and, and how much you still have to learn. And so I want to start by thanking the staff that works with this committee, the nonpartisan and the partisan staff from both sides. Anytime I know myself or any of the other members of the committee had questions, unsure of what was happening, they were all right there to, to help us out. I also want to thank Senator Kunish. I know our, our schedules were incredibly busy this year and I did not have as many meetings with her as I wish we could have along the way, um, but I think we worked together uh, fairly well and were able to talk about things that were coming forward. And I also want to say I appreciate her in-depth explanation of the bill to begin today. Uh, I think that doesn't happen all the time um, on the bills that come here. 
But I also want to talk about some other people who have been ready and willing at a moment's notice to help out to get that understanding. And that is all of the local school personnel uh, back in my district, from superintendents to school board members to teachers. I had multiple times where folks from my district came down to my office to have conversations, to help me get a better understanding and help, and for them to express their concerns with education and where the issues were that they at, were asking me to be their voice to deal with. And countless, countless more emails from the district from, again, school board members, superintendents, and teachers. And so much of what you know, we've said most everything tonight already, so I'm not going to go back and rehash all of that, even though, Mr. President, it sound, looks like you might want me to, but I won't. <laughs> but as I look at the bill, and one of the things, Mr. President, again, we have to look at the totality of what's before us here this year that our school districts are looking at and facing. And this bill as I look at it, is appropriating to all kinds of different areas. And I know there are needs and that our students have, but our school districts, I wish, were the absolute priority with this funding. And I guess one of the provisions that was just uh, talked about that I actually find troubling that we have to have it in this bill, Mr. President, is that we have a provision and funding in here to teach our teachers how to teach kids to read. And as somebody who served on the Higher Education Committee, you know, that's something we've talked about and to me seems like a failure on the end of our higher education to actually have those provisions and teach people who are going through the process of getting their teacher's license to be able to read. And we've heard from so many teachers as they're getting some of this training now, they're like, man, I wish I'd have had that before. And so I think it's great that it's in here, I just feel it's just sad that it has to be in here, and hopefully our higher education uh, institutions will be working on that in the future so it's not something we have to continue with. But I just ultimately think that there's not enough flexibility in this bill for our local school boards to be able to address their specific needs to help them do the things that their unique school districts need to do to help their students and to put the students first. So this bill is close, but uh, unfortunately um, today I will be voting no. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kunis, the author of the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll make it really quick. I, I, I want to thank, first of all, all, again, all of those members that uh, were on our education committee uh, team. I want to um, thank our interns, uh, Georgia. Are you still here? Oh, my gosh. Georgia's here. She's been here the whole day. Annika, she's left. Um, Anne-Marie Lewis and Jana Hofer are still back there hanging in there with us. And Betsy, um, we do hope that you're feeling better. I want to thank all the pages and all the folks up there and in the back that make uh, this um, Senate run so well. Um, Sammy and Regan, our assistants, they are top notch and we couldn't do this without you. Dana uh, Elling and Ryan Majors, uh, your support is, is just so invaluable. I could not have done this without um, Senator Swadzinski. When uh, November came and the results were in and we had a one member uh, DFL majority, uh, my dream was to be uh, a partner with Senator Swadzinski, two of us teachers, uh, making sure, looking at ways to invest in our students and put it in the best way possible. You know, when I think about the work that we've done here and how I got myself organized for an incredible, incredible opportunity, I kind of looked at it like a lesson plan. I looked at what is our objective? What is, what are, what is, what is this, what do we want at the end of the day? What are the outcomes 
that we wanted to make sure our schools, our students, our teachers had. And we had to look at all the different methodologies, and we put those in this, in this omnibus bill. I almost called it a project. Um, we looked at what were the tools that our teachers, that our administrators, that our students would need to be successful. Where could we get those resources from? And when we couldn't supply those resources, we looked for partners, partners in the community. And you will see a beautiful list of grants. I can't tell you how excited I was to be able to fund those. And then we had to look at the activities that we really wanted to be carried out. And we tried to put in as much flexibility for our districts as possible. I know that they are never going to be happy. We are never going to have a, a, a fully funded educational system unless we even double what we have here. But we did the very best with what we had. And at the end of this night, I am confident and I am proud that we have created um, an omnibus that the schools are going to take back to, their, to their, uh, their teachers and to their staff members. And they're going to be able to create the most engaging and uh, engaging and um, rigorous resources that have been invested in our schools for a long time. You know, the other day I was out in the hall here talking with one of our lobbyists. Uh, they were a handful of, of superintendents. They were telling me nothing that I didn't already know. We know the transportation subsidy is just a huge burden. We know that the EL and the SPED um, cross subsidies are really a struggle for our districts. We know all of these things, but when I asked those superintendents, and I just said, like, well, what do you think of my bill? Like, be honest, tell me, what do you think of my bill? And the one superintendent looked at me and he said, you might get a lot of nonsense. You might get a lot of, of um, you know, pushback from here, meaning here in the, in the legislature. He said, but out there, don't worry, out there we love it. And that's what I think about when I listen to the disparaging remarks that are made here tonight. Knowing that in the past, those dollars could have been invested and they were not. And now we are working with the results of that lack of funding. And we're doing it in a good way. So I wish we could fully fund uh, the, our, our educational system this very first year. But we have three more years. We have three more years to build on the platform that we have created right here, right here tonight. And I am looking forward to the continuation of working with our members, our DFL members. Um, and I, I made it very clear from the very beginning that I expected our DFL members to participate fully as well. We welcomed their bills, we included their bills, we took their comments into consideration, and at the end of tonight, this is what we have. And while Senator Mayquay may be giddy, I am extremely giddy. I have never created a project quite like this, or one that I am quite so proud of. And so members, I ask for your full support this evening, and please press that green button to support education in Minnesota. The secretary would take the roll on final passage of House File 2497. Members, remember you have to be at your desk while we are voting. Senator, uh, uh, Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7.
Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Latz votes aye. Senator Fate votes aye. Senator Fate votes aye. And Senator Muhammad votes aye. And Senator Muhammad votes aye. Senator Jasinski, those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Dreheim votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Western votes no. And Senator Western votes no. Members, please vote. All senators have been voting, uh, voted who desires to vote. The secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 32 noes, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Members, we will now proceed to the 13th order of business. Announcements of senators' interest. Members, without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Westrom from 11, uh, Senator Westrom from 11 uh, a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Senator Limmer from 11 uh, a.m. to 11.35 a.m. And Senator Danes from 1.10 p.m. to 1.40 p.m. Any additional announcements of Senate interest? Uh, Senator Marty. Mr. President, thank you. The Senate Finance Committee will not meet until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, so you can sleep a little bit later. Any additional announcements of Senate interest? Seeing none, uh, Senator Kunis, or no, Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Tuesday, April 25th at 11 a.m. On that motion, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the Senate is now adjourned.